two great presenters um, today, um, great coaches, uh, the records and um, their resume speak for themselves, but uh, they're even better people. Uh, and I say that firsthand, having uh, worked for both of them as an assistant coach, um, they're outstanding um, people and uh, we'll learn a lot from them today. Um, so I don't want to talk too much because I've already sort of taken up your time with this little delayed start, but um, uh, if we can just make sure everyone stays on mute throughout other than the person that's going to present, which first up will be Shannon Sebum. Um, Shannon, uh, if not the most successful, certainly right up there, uh, Australian junior coach of all time. Um, he has um, won two golds with world championships, one with the under 17s and one with the world junior games team. Uh, and then one uh, bronze medal with the under 17s. Uh, so three medals from three world championships, which is an outstanding result. Um, he is gonna present today on uh, building his defensive philosophy. Um, and very lucky to have um, Shannon on board. So uh, with no further talking from myself and no further delay, uh, let's get into it and I'll pass over to um, Shannon. Thanks, Reese. Uh, g'day, everyone. Um, sorry, just give me one second. I'm just trying to figure out how to get all of these pictures of everyone's faces off the screen. Um, all right. So, yeah, um, Reese, thanks a lot for the intro. Um, you know, I certainly probably don't, uh, yeah, don't see myself as, um, you know, maybe as advertised, but, you know, I've been very fortunate, I suppose, in my uh, in my coaching career so far to have coached some really phenomenal uh, athletes and also work with some really great coaches along the way. As Reese mentioned, um, you know, when I was the coach of the Sydney Flames, he was uh, one of my assistant coaches and, and I certainly learned, um, you know, probably more from him than he, did, he certainly did from me. So you know, I've been really fortunate, um, you know, also within obviously, and I'll talk about some of this today, but um, you know, my experiences with the Australian uh, national team programs um, with a couple of various teams. And, you know, obviously, you know, when you're in those programs, you obviously get to select a, a fairly talented staff as well. And, um, you know, I, I certainly want to give some props to uh, Mark Robel, Tracy York um, and Mel Downer, who, um, you know, were my assistant coaches and also Cherie Hogg, who was one of my assistants with the World University Games team. So, you know, a lot of the things I'll talk about today are things that, um, you know, it's not everything that I've come up with. It's some things have come from them as well. And, um, you know, being able to match some of our philosophies to, you know, to put together, I suppose, the best systems, um, you know, at that time that we felt gave us the best chance to have success. So um, I'll get into it. I'm just going to share. Hopefully you can see this. So, um, look, I'll get straight into it. But couple of things um, before I start, I suppose, is, you know, I'm going to talk about um, some different defensive philosophies, some pressing philosophies, um, you know, some concepts within the pack line defense. Um, and I certainly don't want people to think that, I, you know, what I'm saying is gospel because it's not, um, you know, there's a million different ways in basketball, I think, to, um, to do something. And, you know, I think our job as coaches is to certainly take a look at you know, one, myself as a coach, what I believe in um, and what I, you know, how I want to coach the game and what I think works in the game. Um, you know, number two, I think, is always look at what type of athletes and what type of players you have um, and then be able to cater your system to allow those athletes to be successful. And then number three, I think, um, you know, is very important as well, is looking at the league that you play in, um, you know, or the competition that you're going to be competing in and having a look at, what some of the strengths and weaknesses of, you know, some of those various teams are going to be. Um, and I would recommend looking at, you know, probably whoever you perceive to be the best or the two or three best teams in your competition or your league um, and really trying to mould your philosophy to be able to beat those teams. Um, you know, I know, f you know, for us personally with the Australian teams, um, you know, and, and every Australian team, I think, that goes away is the main thing that we always look at is how we're going to beat the USA. So if we get to a quarterfinal, a semifinal or a, a gold medal game, you know, what philosophies and what strategies do we have in place that we think can, you know, help us to beat those teams or the top teams in our, in our comp? So 
um, you know, that was part of the, I guess, thought process. And I'll get into a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, probably the, you know, the first thing on this slide here is, uh, you know, I believe, and this was important with the under, the first under 17s team that I had, um, you know, when just like going to a nationals or whatever it may be, you'd never really have a whole lot of time to prepare. Um, so I think it's really important that your philosophy or your system that you're going to be installing is simple enough um, that, you know, that your players can understand every aspect of it and why you do it. Um, you know, so with the, with the 17s group, and I'll, I'll go into some of our philosophy today with, um, you know, that we had success at two under 17 world championships with, but, you know, it had to be simple. You know, we'd get maybe two camps um, to pick our team and install things. Maybe the, f the first tournament, we got one tour uh, to China um, and played six games, which was great because we were able to explore with that philosophy and, and iron out some of the kinks. But in the second World Cup I went to, uh, we didn't get that. So we didn't get a tour. We got, I think, two camps to select the team. Um, and then we headed off to Belarus for the World Cup. So we knew we needed something that the players could understand. And, and then I guess what we did from there was... We kind of, I looked at, you know, what I believe as a coach and my philosophy and um, how I want my teams to play and I actually broke it down into three different phases. So, you know, similar to what people have done on the offensive side with your pace, poise, penetrate or, you know, whatever you want to call those three phases of the shot clock, we broke our defence down into the same type of philosophy. So, you know, I found that, you know, that really helped because with our players and even with other teams that I've coached where I've used this or done this, you know, it, it fits with that whole part, whole method of teaching. So being able to sort of show some film, as I'll show you guys a little bit today as well, um, hopefully it works, but being able to show, you know, the, the entire defense um, and explain the system and be able to explain why we think this is the best system for us and sell to the players how, you know, how we think this is going to help them be successful and us, to, you know, our team to be able to win a gold medal or win our comp. Um, and then, you know, when we get into our practice sessions, once they've seen the whole, now we can teach each, each piece individually, um, you know, to get all the detail in and the, the small details that we need to be able to execute to be successful. And then you bring it back to the whole again when you scrimmage or when you go into your games and, and then you teach from there. So, you know, I found that was a, a really good way um, to prepare our teams in a short space of time and be as efficient as possible. Um, you know, the other things I like about this system, so, you know, I, like I'm not a big, I, you know, I say this when this year in the WNBL, I think I probably went um, away from some of my beliefs and philosophies trying to search for answers and search for quick solutions, um, which I don't think is the best way. So what I like about this is, you know, we, we're very clear and consistent on how we defend our specific actions, you know, so whether that's, our one-on-one -on -one closeouts, whether it's a you know our pack philosophy, whether it's guarding specific sets or um, you know common actions like a pistols action or a horns flare action or a screen the screener like small to big screen the screener action, um, you know depending on the the part of the floor and things like that. But we're very consistent with how we do that. So you know I I believe that's a you know it's a good way to go even though maybe you give up a little bit to some really talented players by guarding it the same way every time, I feel that, you know, over the course of a season or over a course of, you know, five, six, seven week preparation where you can use film and, and teach, it gives your players the chance to be really good. Um, you know, if we had have chopped and changed every game and said, we're going to go under this screen against this player and today we're going to switch this cross screen, tomorrow we're going to go underneath it, you know, unless you've got really talented players or your players are simply better than the other team's players, you're probably not going to defend those actions quite as well or as effectively. Um, and the last thing I really like, um, I, you know, I believe that this system is really easily adaptable across, you know, a, a variety of different levels. So, um, you know, for example, in Newcastle, where I was the coaching director, we would actually implement certain parts of this philosophy from under 12s all the way through to our senior team. So, um, you know, obviously the seniors would get the entire package plus, you know, coaches have their own spin on things and um, things like that. And then obviously under 12s, it's very basic, but it's teaching common languages, you know, using the same teaching points and, you know, and really selling what the philosophy is and the mindset behind our defense. Uh, a couple things. So, 
you know, with teams that I coach, um, and again, doing this presentation and having to think about all of these things again has been great for me in my, you know, my current off season because it's given me a lot more ideas of of what I want to be next season. Um, but some of the things that you know, with my teams, I think are non-negotiables, or that if we do these things, are going to help us uh, be successful. Um, number one is full court pickups. So you know, again, I I get pressing and gambling and things isn't for everybody, but I don't think you know, you have to necessarily gamble all the time. I, you know, I don't mind it. I like being aggressive and doing that if it suits my personnel. Um, you know, if I have quick point guards and quick two guards and athletic fours that can get up the floor and trap and run and jump and do things like that, we'll go after it. But even if I don't, um, you know, my point guard's a bit slower or something, we'll still find ways of guarding the ball within our, you know, within our ability up the floor. You know, I'd never want to just sit back at the three-point line um, unless we're playing zone or something and allow teams just to walk the ball up and get into their offense. Um, the second point is communication. So, you know, it's the biggest thing I think for if young players could take one thing away, if they want to be pros is learn very quickly how to talk effectively on the floor. So, you know, we, you know, we use the term early, loud and continuous. Um, so, you know, and that comes to everything. Our closeouts, our, you know, our gap help positioning, our low player, you know, pick and rolls, pin down screens, all of those things, we want to make sure that we're talking those, um, you know, and communicating to people as early, loud and continuously as we can on the floor. Um, number three, you know, is our pack positioning or our gap help spots. Um, you know, and I'll show some clips in a minute, but, the, you know, if you want to play the pack defense, being disciplined with that is the most important thing. You know, if you give up, um, you know, and I'll get to close out shortly, but if you're giving up a lot of straight line penetration or you don't have players, you know, in the right positions in the floor, um, you know, crowding the court up, it becomes very hard to get stops and you're going to give up a lot of easy, you know, three-point shots, layups and free throws, which we don't want. Um, number four is multiple efforts. So, you know, again, it doesn't matter what type of defense you play and you go and watch a lot of film, um, you know, and I watch my team this season after our games and I do our cut-ups um, and, you know, you'd find a lot of possessions where players off the ball are just standing out of stance or standing around. Um, and what you'll find is they'll always be late for the next the next thing they have to defend. So, you know, if I'm on the weak side and then all of a sudden there's a down screen and I'm out of stance, I'm, you can bet I'm going to be late chasing Key and Nurse off a pin down for an open three. You know, whereas if we're in a stance and we're on the balls of our feet and we're constantly active and fighting for our position, um, you know, it gives us a much better chance of getting stops and being effective defensively. Uh, and the last one, again, is a fairly universal term. I think... Any basketball game you ever go to, you'll hear coaches call this out, but blockouts, um, you know, it can't be stated. There's no point, you know, asking our point guards to pick up, you know, talking every screen, being in the right spots, playing with multiple efforts if we don't block out and finish a play. You know, the worst, I think the, the coach killers, um, you know, are always those second chance points. So, you know, offensive rebound, kick out three late in the game. Um, you know, I think, you know, Canberra had to play like that at the end of their game that won them a title. So Kia Nurse ended with a three um, at the top of the key, you know, off a loose ball get or something like that um, and won them a championship. So, you know, you can look at it on the other side, the south side, missing that opportunity could probably cost them a title. Uh, just quickly before I get to, um, you know, some of the system stuff, some other things maybe you guys would like to think about um, and they don't have to be these goals, but you know, we, can't, we try and look at our, you know, our philosophy and our system um, and give our players goals every game. So, you know, we know when we go into games what boxes we need to tick defensively to give ourselves a chance to beat the best team in our league. So, you know, for us, um, you know, it's less than 30 points in the paint. I think this year in the WNBL, the best team in the league defensively was Melbourne and they gave up 32.7. So, you know, 30 is ambitious, you know, but our belief is if we set ambitious goals and we get, you know, get to 32 or 31 points, well, that's going to be good enough to help us win. Um, you know, less than 15 free throw attempts. So again, the analytics come into it a little bit. We don't want to foul. We don't want to put teams um, to the free throw line. Again, it's the highest value shot in the game. So we don't want to be giving that up. Again, less than 10 0 boards a game comes back to that blockout philosophy. Um, and again, effective field goal percentage. So um, for, you know, for anyone that's maybe unsure what that is, um, basically, you know, you've got your standard field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage uh, actually adds in the value of the three-point shot. So, you know, our goal is under 46% uh, 
um, you know, effective field goals. So again, you you know, you need to be able to defend that line these days. Um, I think uh, again, Melbourne were the best team in the WNBL this year, and I think there was only two teams in the league that were under forty six percent. So every other team was forty seven or above. Um, you know, including mine, and that's something this season. You know, this upcoming season, um, whenever that. You know, whenever that is, uh, that's going to be a goal that we're going to be definitely looking to tick off this year. Um, and the last one, people have probably heard of this, but uh, we call them kills. So we want to get six lots, at least six lots of three consecutive stops um, every single game that we play. Okay, so uh, now I'll just get into, so I spoke about this a minute ago, but just how we break the, um, the shot clock up defensively. So... Again, this is, it's nothing, um, you know, nothing too complex. And it's, I certainly, you know, we're certainly not reinventing the wheel or anything like that. And it's probably, you know, nothing that coaches haven't done or thought of before. But I just feel like I said, I feel like breaking it up like this um, certainly helps, you know, teaching it, but also helps players understanding it exactly what we want in each phase um, defensively. So, you know, the first, uh, first eight seconds of the clock. So there's obviously two situations we can have a missed shot. Um, which means we're in defensive transition. So, you know, our goal in that, um, you, you know, I like to have three players go to the offensive glass, one person back um, and another player, at, which is usually our point guard or our one or our two, sort of hovering around the top of the three-point line, um, ready to pick up the ball handler. So we want to be able to do that every single time. Obviously, when we lose possession, the other team rebounds the ball. You know, we need to have some urgency. So we need to sprint back. Our goal is to get you know, a big back to the basket, get our guards back to guard the wings and really try and build a wall, um, you know, and clog the floor up as much as we can in that early phase of the clock. I feel like, you know, under, you know, under 12s, under 14s, under 16s, probably 60 plus percent of the basket scored are in transition. You know, in the pro game, it's a little bit less, but, you know, my team last season, we gave up the most, more points in the early phase of the clock um, than any other phase. So, you know, that's an area we certainly need to work on uh, for next season. But, you know, it's a, it's a really important phase. Um, the other way, obviously, you get to your first eight seconds is off a score or a dead ball where the referees touch the ball. So, you know, for us on made baskets, where we can, we want, we want to try and get our foreman to pick up the inbounder, um, you know, and really pressure the inbounds pass. Our point guard to find the opposing point guard as quick or the, the matchup as quickly as possible. Um, you know, and we want to really, we want to be smart but we want to disrupt. We want to try and take at least eight to 10 seconds off the clock um, before the other team gets into their, you know, into their half court offense. We feel like if we do that, then it takes a lot of pressure off, you know, the rest of our defense, um, only having to guard for 12, 14, you know, 15 seconds every single time. Uh, the middle phase, and I'll get to some of the detail around this, but the middle phase for us, once they've made, there's been an entry pass into offense, uh, we're into our pack help position. So, you know, so we want to shrink the floor. We want to keep the ball away from the keyway. Um, you know, not allow easy post catches, not allow, um, you know, not allow people to be able to penetrate through the elbows or penetrate baseline for layups. Because, it, because again, we feel that giving up those, you know, those types of penetrations, um, you know, give up the highest percentage or highest value shots in the game. So your layups, free throws uh, and wide open three point shots. Um, you know, in this phase, it's really important to us. So this is where our multiple efforts start kicking in. So, you know, can our players stay in a stance? Can they, um, you know, fight through a down screen? Can they talk a pick and roll and come out and hard show and then recover quickly and then get to a post-defensive uh, set or look? So, you know, all of those things are really important for us. And then in the last eight seconds, um, you know, it's about sticking to our, our philosophy, our plan. So, you know, not allowing, you know, not breaking down and not getting out of stance or not creeping out of our pack and opening the floor up and giving up a layup. Once we get teams to that last eight seconds, that's where we feel like, you know, our players should start licking their lips and, and really sitting down the stance and playing, okay? Because now it's a chance to force a bad shot and start our transition. Um, one thing we do, so, and it's, again, it's not new, but, um, you know, I've found it to be really successful when you package it with the other parts of this defense is, we switch late clock pick and rolls um, and we call that hustle. Okay. So I've heard, you know, other teams I've been with have called it ice. Um, you know, one of my coaches has been a mentor to me. I uh, used to call it butter. 
Um, you know, so you can give that that anything you you know any, anything you want. But if we call hustle, our players know that we're switching pick and rolls um, and most dribble handoffs. Okay, and again, we feel that that helps um, late in the clock to keep the ball on the three point line. It's a lot harder for um, defense, uh, sorry, offenses to penalize a switch um, on a post up or with more ball movement when there's only five, six, four, whatever seconds to go um, on the shot clock. Quite often you then find these, you know, the guards trying to take on a big, which we hope leads to a contested jump shot um, that we can rebound and run off. All right, I'm just gonna uh, switch my screen. So go to a little bit of film. I hope, um, I hope for everybody that this works. I, I trialed it today and it seemed to work okay. Um, if it doesn't work or it's a bit laggy, I apologize. I think Reese is recording this um, and he, we had a practice run today and it worked quite well. So I'm just going to go through a few clips um, to begin with just, you know, of some of my team and some of other teams that I like and um, I've seen do these things well, just to explain some of the, you know, the early clock, um, I suppose, concepts. So the first clip we've got is um, Virginia Commonwealth University who used to be coached by a coach by the name of Shaka Smart, who's probably one of the best pressing coaches uh, in college basketball. So, just mute these. Okay, so this is just a good look at, um, you know, some of our dog and plugger concepts. So I spoke about our, um, in the clip start, you can see the players just in inbounded the ball. So we've got our dog now coming to pick up uh, the point guard and our plugger now getting towards the middle of the floor here to, you know, to shrink the floor. Um, one thing I, you know, as a coach that, you know, tells me that we're doing a good job of disrupting a team's rhythm is when you start seeing teams bring this third player into the backcourt. You know, I think when teams start doing that, um, you know, I know for me, I, I certainly think that that's a sign we're starting to get them rattled um, and we should start picking our aggressiveness up a little bit more, um, you know, because that's where we've got a bit of an advantage. So, again, you see as the play evolves, you know, there's good pressure. One of the things we talk about a lot off the ball is being uh, up the line. Okay, so you see um, just here this player in the circle uh, and this other player here, right? You know, they're doing a good job of shrinking the floor. So now this ball handler, right, doesn't see as much space to be able to attack. You know, and you can see the guy here, right, is doing a really good job of stunting at the ball handler. So he's faking with his feet, faking with his hands, right, trying to fake like we're coming to trap or we're going to be disruptive. And it automatically puts this guard now um, into a sped up situation. So they've seen the stunt. They've, they're not sure. They've probably been trapped already in this game, I would imagine, right? So now they're a little bit more worried or concerned about it. So they make a quick crossover and you can see they fumble the ball so and now lose vision of the rest of the court, right? So, you know, this is a perfect example of being able to disrupt in the full court and how it takes teams out of their flow. So this is Kansas on offense, who's probably one of the best teams, um, coached by one of the best coaches on the planet. Um, you know, and you can see just that little bit of extra full court disruption has them rattled. Um, and, you know, in the college games, it was a 35 second shot clock. They haven't run any offense and already burnt 15 seconds off the clock. So for us, you know, there's nine seconds left. There's not much that team's gonna do against us. Okay, another clip. So, uh, again, this is Fenerbahce, so a EuroLeague team. Um, again, you know, they, they're an aggressive full-court team, right? Don't do a whole lot of trapping in the EuroLeague because of the talent level, but they definitely disrupt uh, early in the clock, right? So, you know, we call this 55 face. So, 55 is our full-court man-to-man, right? And you see now at the plugger, instead of guarding the ball, is going to go and face guard the other team's point guard. So, trying to take it out of that player's hands. You see this player's unguarded because they're a five man, so not a good ball handler, right? They give it back to the inbound and now, right? And I love this, right? So you see just that little bit of extra disruption now forces teams to run some more action to get it to their point guard's hands, right? Takes more time off the clock, right? And then you see again, the plugger being very, probably a little more aggressive than I like because they're letting their man get behind their head, but, you know, being very aggressive, you know, stunting at this point guard, which forces them to change hands and turn, right? You see, again, a fumble, right? The ball pressure is great. Like, you know, being able to stay touch distance from the guard full court um, is an elite skill and it's something that we need to teach our players to do. And you see again, so now, right, you know, they've lost vision, they've cut off half the court, right? 
And the thing I really like about this, you see this plugger as they turn fakes a trap, right? Which gets the guard even more on their heels. So you see, again, the shot clock here is down to 15 already, right? They haven't, they've only just crossed half court. They haven't run any action. Now high ball screen comes and on the first pass, there's only 12 seconds to go in the entire possession. So, you know, for, for my teams, we'd only have to play for four seconds in the half court before we're in our switching rules. So, you know, for us, we feel like that gives us a big advantage straight away. Um, this, is one of, uh, this is one of my under-17s. So this is the team that won a gold medal. Um, again, I don't know why FIBA loves zooming in on the player that scored the last basket. So you miss, the, you know, miss what's happening on the whole court. But again, you can see here, so, you know, we, we've done a good job in this game against China of building pressure. So now they were bringing three players into the backcourt every time. So for us, that's great because now we can really look to be aggressive and trap. Right? One of the things that we look at, so we teach our plugger. So this player here, anytime this point guard either zooms up the sideline or you feel like they've lost vision of the court or they're out of control, that automatically triggers um, a, what we call a chase down, okay, or a trap. So again, you see here now, you know, they've dribbled sort of through that trapping zone at half court. You can see this is actually our point guard. They had their point guard inbound in the ball, but the rules don't change. So, you know, you can see now they we've recognized that and we're going after them, right? We do a good job of trying to cut off the sideline, right? And the other thing I really like in this is you can see here, so Sam Simon's number 10, right, is, you know, has great awareness of what's happening. So anytime we see the plugger go to, to trap, we want this player here to ro start rotating right, over to cut off the easiest pass, right? And then you see this player here uh, as the frame evolves, right, our post player here, right, they're going to get into a three-quarter front and then a denial once the trap happens. So we cut off the first two easy passes, right? And then our, our player at the back, Rebecca Pizzi here, her job now is to guard these two players. So, you know, I'll show another clip in a second. All right, so again, this is off a made basket. Again, dog plug situation, right? See Kira Rowe, really smart four-man, um, did a great job for us. Abby's done a good job on the ball, right? Again, you can see this player here has completely lost vision of the other side of the court. They're only looking down here, right? Triggers our, our chance to go on trap, right? Now, the one thing on this clip that we could have done a little bit better, you see the girl here, as we start seeing that happen, we want to start shading towards this player. Not all the way to them, right? But we want to start shading towards. And what we teach our players on this any trap situation, whether it's in the full court, half court, a pick and roll or a post up, doesn't matter, is we'll always teach the players off the ball to read the passer's eyes. So you can see right now they pick the ball up. They're looking here, right? So that should cue us rotating up, right? And now this player here is and starting to anticipate having to rotate across. So, you know, you see we're a little bit late, but the one thing I like is we're, we keep our hands out and don't foul and we force them into a bounce pass. So again, a slower pass. If we were a little bit earlier rotating, we would have picked that off and got a layup, right? But it, it slows it down. It gives people a chance now to be able to adjust. So like I said, on this rotation, we've now won our five, right? Being confident to go out early on this. And then the player that was on this sideline here denying that pass to rotate in, right? And then the two players that are in the trap are gonna drop below the line of the ball and find a matchup. Now, you see here, Lucy doesn't quite go out, sort of stunts at it, and then Mila is able to make a chase down play. Um, again, you know, with this in, in the pro game, you've got to be quite careful, right? Because depending on who that player there is, you know, that could be an automatic three. But, you know, I'm kind of of the belief that we'll, we'll be aggressive. If they make one or two of those, then we'll probably get out of the trapping and just try and delay. Um, but the one thing I really like is, you know, from a psycho, I guess a psychological perspective, if that player misses that shot um, and we get the rebound and run off it, their coach is not going to be pleased um, and the players are going to be hesitant to take that shot again. So, you know, it's a little bit of a gamble, but I find that more often than not, it pays off. And we feel like those quick shots, you know, within the first eight seconds, if they're shooting like that, are as good as a turnover. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, diamond press. So... You know, we use this a little bit as well. And again, it's just a good way of getting up in the full court, being really aggressive. So this is Virginia Commonwealth again. You see their four mans on the inbounder uh, being aggressive. They've, we've now got a 1-2-1-1 one, one, one format. So they've got two guards up in the backcourt, right? An interceptor uh, at the midcourt, 
right? And uh, the post player's back on the basket, which you can't see in this frame. But what we're looking for here is on the, on the first pass. So as soon as the ball's thrown in, on the flight of the pass, we're going to trap the point guard, right? The closer we can get that first pass to the corner, uh, the better, right? Because it's such a hard place to play. You can't dribble too far backwards, right? And you can't dribble across the sideline. So it's a great, you know, great chance to build an advantage. Um, so we get the trap here. So, right, it's a great trap. The first look again is read the eyes. So you can see here that the passer is now looking in this direction. So we'd want this player here to be rotating up, looking to pick that off. Okay, you see now the offensive player is smart. So he's got space. He uses a back dribble to give himself a little bit more room. And now he pivots and, cha and changes where his sight goes. So now he's looking here, right? So again, this player now backs out of going there and he starts to shift this way. And you see just in the edge of the frame here, our interceptor that's in the middle of the floor now starts to shade here. Okay, and again, reading the eyes, you know, I'd really, if you want to be a pressing coach or a pressing team, finding ways to drill trapping with maybe three or four players, something like that, and really help your players learn to anticipate. Um, you know, like it's no good being able to press if you're always just going to give up this pass and never get any reward. Um, but being able to anticipate, you see he's already on the move because he knows the pass is coming, right? And they're able to pick it off and get a cheap basket. Um, you know, and then, and again, the benefit of that is you get to set your defense and press again and build momentum. So, you know, I really like that. Here's one of my, again, one of my teams in the diamond. So again, you see our one, two, one, one. Um, and this is a good clip because it doesn't go to plan. So we're trying to force the ball uh, to this corner here. Right, we do almost too good a job and deny it in, so we we don't let him throw it. And now the other guard swings across the floor, and we end up in a, a really bad. We think this is a bad situation. So now when the inbounds happen, we've already got two players behind the ball. So this is what we would call a fix it situation. Okay, so now we're we're at a, di a big disadvantage, um, and we need to be able to fix it and get people back behind the ball. So you see here, right, the inbounds pass happens. Right, we would want. In this situation, the easiest thing to do would be Mila, good child, to take that. And Sam Simons, who's at half court, should have knowledge of who's behind her in that interceptor spot, right? And she'll just rotate straight back to them. We don't do that. Sam comes to take the ball. And luckily, Mila has the heads up to be able to sprint back and hustle. And again, this is something we practiced a lot um, because, you, you know, you're never going to be perfect. You're going to have to fix situations uh, when you want to press. So we practice this quite a lot. Um, and what, by the time they catch this ball, we're able to sprint back, right? You know, and again, you know, they trip over, right? It's not a great ball handler and you see some great hustle um, to be able to get back in the play and come up with a loose ball and win us a possession. So, you know, that's, that's a little bit of what we do uh, in the, you know, in the first phase of the clock. I'm just going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, if you have questions and things, I'll try and have some time at the at the end if uh, Reese um, allows it. I know Gory's got to speak to, and I don't want to take up his time. Um, hopefully, everybody can see the next slide, right? So now we're just going to talk a little bit about um, our pack line system. So, you know, this is more once we get teams into the half court. Okay, so our pack line. You see the first uh, diagram over here with the red line. That's the pack line. Okay, so it's a line. You know, 17 or so feet um, from the basket. Again, depending on what you're coaching, men, women, juniors, seniors, your pack line may be further from the basket, right? Because obviously the skill level, the athleticism, size, all those things change. So you need to be able to adjust. But, you know, we like to really try and crowd the floor um, and pack it in. So we have basically all four players that are not guarding the ball, right, are going to have both feet on the pack line or both feet inside the pack. Okay, if you... You know, if the ball's on the wing, then someone will be on a low split position or, you know, we still do all of that, right? But we want to make sure that players that are one pass away, as you see in the diagram at the bottom of the page, right, are kind of halfway between the ball and halfway between their man in a flat triangle stance, which I'll show in a minute. Um, you know, and really you can see just in that diagram how much space it takes away uh, from the ball handler. So that allows us then to pressure the ball a lot more heavily because there's less penalty, there's less space, uh, less chance of blow by penetration. Um, and we feel like if we can pressure the ball, um, you know, it's going to do enough to slow the other team's offensive execution. We don't need lane pressure. Um, this defense requires, 
uh, you know, a lot of discipline. So, you know, X3 and X4 here can't be flying out of their pack positions trying to steal um, and gambling because, again, it opens up back doors and gives up, again, that equals high percentage shots or high efficiency shots. Um, and it also opens up those driving lanes for number one there to blow by his man um, and put us into rotations. Okay, so again, that's probably one of the biggest things for us we felt with the under 17s um, when we picked you know, when we selected to use this defense is we looked at um, the United States and Spain played in the final. We looked at those two teams throughout that tournament and what their offensive systems were. And just like a lot of Australian systems, it was a lot of split kick extra basketball. So a lot of dribble penetration or pick and rolls um, into penetration, draw help, kick out to open three point shooters, you know, be able to get to the, the paint and draw fouls and get to the foul line. Um, Spain had a girl had 40 points in the final just by attacking off pick and rolls um, and being able to get in the rim. So we wanted to be able to slow that down, keep the ball in the three-point line, and we felt this defense was the best way to do it. Um, again, I've talked about this already, but this is a multiple effort defense. So I think there's some misconceptions about pack defense being a sag defense, uh, which I think you know equates to lazy defense. Um, and some teams probably are that. They probably feel they can just sit back, be lazy and sit there. We don't allow that. So we want all of our players, um, every single possession, every time the ball moves to be active. So you must be in a stance. You must move on the flight of the pass. Um, you know, and you have to be ready to fight through screens and still do all of the things you normally have to do um, while we're trying to get this done. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things for me, and I think the under-17 teams that I had, I was very lucky. We had super high-character kids. So willing to buy in, um, you know, willing to sacrifice for their teammates, willing to, you know, basically bust their butts every single time down defensively. Um, and you don't always get that. You know, sometimes players just refuse to commit on the defensive side of the floor for whatever reason. Um, and that can really hurt you. So I think, you know, having high character players that buy in, that listen, that understand the why um, and want to be great and want to be great for their teammates, um, you know, is really important when it comes to selection. Okay, and just quickly talk about closeouts. So I think this is probably, you know, it's the most common action in a pack line half court defensive um, system, right? Again, you think about uh, pick and roll basketball now is designed to put two players on the ball, right, and put players that are in help positions into closeouts. So, you know, every time the ball shifts in a pack, you must close, you know, it goes to your man, you're in a closeout. Every time there's a skip pass or dribble penetration and a kick out, you're into a closeout. So, you know, it's something that needs to be practiced and drilled over and over, you know, pro probably every session at the start of your season um, until you feel like your kids are good at it. And then it needs to be done every week um, to be able to maintain and continue improving the entire team. Um, some things on technique for closeouts. Um, for me, you know, I, I think it's all in the first couple of steps. So, you know, like I said, on the flight of the pass, being able to sprint, being able to get to your man quickly, because we are, you know, maybe a metre or two off of our player sometimes, you need to be able to get there fast and one, take away a shot, and then two, be able to contain penetration. So one of the things we teach... Uh, which isn't everyone's cup of tea, and I understand that, um, is arriving with two high hands. So I think, you know, especially pick and roll basketball, one of the things that generally happen after um, a pass out of a pick and roll is going to be a high-low pass, right? You think about your flow offense, for example, out of a drag screen, that's the first look. Um, or, you know, players looking to catch and shoot. So we feel like having our hands up slows down the ability to throw the high-low, makes them use a pass fake or change how they're going to pass. Um, and then obviously puts us in a position to be able to get some type of contest on a perimeter shot. Um, the other thing I teach, so with the feet, is we want them to be parallel to the three-point line. So that doesn't mean on the three-point line. It might be inside, might be a short closeout. It might be just outside against a really great player. Um, but we want our feet to be parallel um, because, you know, I think the number one thing players are taught um, and it goes back to your two high hands as well. But if I close out with one high hand, generally that if I have my left hand up, my left foot will be out in front of my right foot. Um, and I think the, you know, the number one thing that like I teach players when they're attacking closeouts is always attack the lead foot. So if we give them a lead foot and it happens to be the wrong way, um, where we're giving up a straight line drive baseline or something like that, um, 
you know, that's going to really hurt our defense. Okay. Cause one of the, you know, one of the things that makes this defense unique um, is we don't actually allow drives towards the baseline. Okay. So it's very different to a force, uh, force baseline defense or your more traditional types of defense. Um, because we again, I feel like, you know, every, every shell drill, that you do where you say force baseline, you're automatically putting yourself into a rotation. Um, you know, and we felt like rotations were going to get us killed. They were going to give up layups, give up fouls, and give up your split kick extra threes, um, which are what teams at the end of the day want. We want to make them do things they're not comfortable with. Um, and the last point here is, you know, I feel that all players on a closeout must be able to contain two dribbles on their own. Um, you know, if we can guard one dribble on our own, Chances are we're sending them into our, pack, our gap help or our pack help, um, which is going to allow us to get a stop. But if you can guard two dribbles on your own, now we've got a chance to be elite. You know, and I think the world's best defences and the world's best defenders all have the ability to be able to do that. Um, all right, I'm just going to go back to the video. Okay, and I'm just going to start with a, cu a couple other clips. So... Uh, I got these off these are uh, off the site B-Ball Immersion, uh, off the YouTube site, sorry, B-Ball Immersion. It's a, um, a great resource for coaches, obviously, that want to learn more about the game. Um, but this is a, co a coach that's a, you know, a really good pack line coach and has coached it for a lot of years. He worked with some of the coaches that created the defense. Um, and I just felt these clips really give a, a good, uh, I guess, example um, of what your positioning and what our stances should look like. So this is a... a a drill, three players, two coaches, um, and it's all about your positioning, moving on the flight of a pass, your closeouts, um, and you'll see as this starts rolling the multiple efforts involved, um, you know, to really be a lead at this. So straight away we see, you know, the guy here, they're probably a little closer to the ball than their man. Um, I'd like, you know, if anything, I'd probably be a little closer to my man than the ball, but this coach prefers it the other way. But again, you see the stance, so it's that flat triangle stance, They've got their hands out. All players have got their hands up, right? And we really talk about that. So we call that eating space. We want to eat space with our arms, really shrink the floor. Um, again, if you imagine there's a player guarding the ball here, right? You know, and they're pressuring the ball. This ball handler really doesn't have a lot of space to be able to attack. So you see as it, as it evolves, you know, as exchanges on the weak side, the players always recover to their gap. So you'll see they're never running directly to their man unless the ball's passed to them, right? They're always recovering to a gap. So again, there's a closeout. The ball moves as it's in the air and being caught. They're already in their next help position. Okay, again, this is, you know, you'll see as this goes, but on the penetration, this team will stunt. So they just take one quick step and recover, right? On any dribble penetration, you see here, it's probably overdone. That's a three in our, in our games. Right, and again, I feel like their positioning is a little too close, um, but it, you know it's a drill, and they're they're probably really excited. But again, quick stunt and then recover to your man, so you take away kick kick out passes. Again, penetration, right, stunting the ball handler, really taking away those driving lanes, and then being able to close out again uh, effectively every time. Okay, second one is a same thing, and these are drills you guys might be able to. I can send you this film or links to some of these, and these are drills you can use with your team um, to really drill and nail down the habits of, you know, of being a lead at this. Again, you see on the ball shift, this is a different drill. So pass and cut, right? Every player on the flight of the pass, right? You see, if I slow it down, is, is moving. So they're all moving to their next help position. We've got a close out, low player, high player, and the player that was guarding the ball, jump into the ball so they don't get face cut. Um, you see, again, this is an important concept um, for our defense as well. Any player that cuts through the keyway, right? We want to try and if, you know, within reason, this is a little bit too far again for my liking. Um, but again, within reason, we want to tag that player. So we get a handout, right? Go and tag or bump them through the keyway, right? One, just tell them we're there. Two, show the person that's the passer um, that there's no option to throw the ball there. And three, I just think it's a great skill to develop with players because it, it improves their weak side awareness. So, doesn't matter if you're playing no middle, pack line, whatever you're playing. I feel like if your players have great awareness off the ball, um, you know, you've got a chance to be elite. And again, you'll see after the tag, rather than just running straight out to, you know, their match or their player, right, they recover to their gap. So we're always getting to that gap, creating that image of the crowded floor, 
right, and not giving this ball handler the opportunity to break down the middle of our defence. Again, another tag you see, so two tags, right, and then straight into active recovery. The guy at the top here, right, is getting into his gap and he's ready to play again. I'm just going to take a look now at a couple, again, a couple of possessions of um, one of my Australian teams. You know, and we'll just show like a possession in its entirety. So again, there's been a score, right? Our plugger didn't get to the inbounder, but they're in a good position now to plug the floor, right? Our point guard, you know, China had some really quick guards, so we weren't going to get all up in their face initially. But you see, as the game goes, um, you know, we did. But again, I, I'm really happy with this level of pressure. We're not just allowing them to walk the ball up not allowing them just to flow straight into whatever offense they want to run. And you see we're making the point guard change hands, right, and really have to protect the ball. You know, you see here, um, Monique Conti, you know, she's an elite, um, def you know, defensive point guard. She's got great foot speed and, and a skill set to be able to do this. But you see how much pressure this point guard's under. And then you see how far away from the three-point line this ball's caught. So, you know, again, as the ball moves, you see our players now all moving on the flight. Um, Sam here has done a great job with their closeout. So one of the, the other things I didn't, I don't think I mentioned, but is we actually teach on our closeout to get um, our nose on the offensive player's low shoulder. Okay, so feet are parallel to the three, right? You can see there, and it, their nose is on the low shoulder. So again, we feel like that, that automatically puts us in a position to take away a baseline drive. And you'll see as as Mon drops now, so she's, you know, point guard so far away and they're so far outside the three. We're not necessarily in our deep pack position. We're a little bit further out, but we're still clogging up this driving lane. So we've got the low shoulder covered, the driving lane covered. And you'll see here, one of our things with our post players is we're always in a three quarter denial. Okay, so we don't want to just allow a straight line pass into the post, right? We want to get a hand around, we want to have our chest on their high shoulder. Um, and really make that difficult. Again, the ball shifts. So you see now, right, already 15 seconds uh, left on the shot clock and their point guard's almost a half court. You know, now they run a press, pressure release, so they flash, right? And again, you see Lucy here on the low post, right? They're looking at a high low, so she does a good job of fighting this, right? Getting a hand around. You see Kira on her closeout, those two high hands, right? Jazz here is in a pack position and now Mon's dropping... Uh, into this position here to clog it up. So this ball handler has no entry pass and really nowhere to go, right? And again, the shot clock's still ticking down. Now you see again, Jazz does a great job. So nose on low shoulder on the closeout. Now they're going to flow into a ball screen, right? And you'll notice the shot clock. So now, right, we're down, oh, sorry, up here, right? We're, we're down to that last eight seconds, right? So now we're into our switching defense. So you see here again, Monique's in a pack. Kira's going to switch out. Right, we like we like being aggressive. That probably wasn't aggressive enough, but again, we've done a good job of containing. And because, like I said, with late clock switching, I feel like it's really hard for teams to penalise uh, on the interior late clock um, because there's not enough time. So you see, we switch it out. Right, we teach our players. So we want to be between right the ball and the roller. So there's no direct line pass to that. Right, and again, you see we've clogged the lane up. They've had to make one more pass. Right, so with six seconds now, right, we're into a one-on-one. -on -one. We've got our pack help here. We've got Kira here clogging the elbow because of their spacing, right? Mon does a great job of containing two dribbles on her own, right? And now they've got no option but to force up a contested three at the back end of the clock. So, you know, that gives you a bit of a feel, I think, for, you know, when this defense is clicking at its best, what it looks like. Um, you know, and this, team, this, this group of girls, to their credit, fully bought in, and we had a lot of... Um, a lot of success with that. So just show one more. So again, we've got our plugger, we've got our dot late pickup with our dog, but we get there. And again, you see, just see the level of ball pressure. We're not allowing them just to casually get into things, right? Now we're into, into our pack and our closeouts. Again, we drop, right? You can see Lara here, right? Is getting to her three quarter, right? Now on this weak side. So again, we talk about multiple efforts. So you know, Sam, Sam's man started over here. Now they're sprinting off a pin down, right? We always try and get our players. So if the gap's that big, we can trail the screen. If there's not a gap, we get our screen defender here to leave space so we can shoot the gap because we feel that puts this player here 
you know, you know, we're not scared of being beat on flare cuts, but we feel like it puts them in a great position to get into their pack held positioning. Okay, so again, you see the ball pressure, right? They're already down to 15 seconds again, right? The ball hasn't threatened the paint. So two possessions in a row now, the ball hasn't threatened the keyway, right? This flash here, so this is actually a breakdown. So you see Mon now should stay attached to her player that she drops off, right? But because Mila now is active, right, and Lara's active and looks like she's ready to play defense, we get a really good stunt here, right, which takes away a driving lane, takes a, makes them second guess about shooting the ball, right? And it allows us then to close out and get a good contest, right, on a three. And what I love about this clip is you see straight away, so shooter, Right, post, you see Beck Pizzi here and Simons all thinking about going to block out their man and finish the play. Okay, again, another clip. So it's a Virginia and uh, NCAA, right? One of the best defensive teams in college basketball. They use, they utilize the pack line defense. Um, and Tony, uh, yeah, the head coach's father actually invented the defense. So, you know, so if there's anyone to watch, um, I'd recommend watching these guys. Right, but again, this is just a good clip. You see, you know, a lot of multiple effort plays. Um, this is from the NCAA championship. So Texas Tech run a lot of uh, blur cuts and dribble drive type offense. So you can see Virginia has scouted this really well and they're switching a lot. Right, again, another switch. And again, I think switching is a great thing to throw in um, to this type of defense because it allows you to keep your shape. Um, and you can see how crowded the middle of the floor is right now. So any penetration Texas Tech thought they were going to get um, doesn't exist. You know, force them into ball movement. Again, you see great pack positioning here, right, to protect the elbow, right? Again, a two-hand high, two hand closeout, right, to be able to stop any high-low pass, right? And now we start talking about, you know, our multiple efforts on multiple actions, right? So on this side here, we've got a flare screen, and in the middle of the floor, they're going to flow into a step-up ball screen. So, you know, you just take a look at this, right? So, you know, we guard flares the same way, or this is a hammer or a flare screen, right? We want to go over the top because we, you know, we feel like flare screens are designed to get threes. So we don't want to give up threes and we want the screen defender to open up to protect on any curl cut. So if they'd have curled that to the basket, this player here is going to track it with his arms um, and try and protect, right? And now you see the action. So again, really good offenses, you know, you hear coaches talk about offense. So as one action's ending, another one's beginning, right? So that's your timing factor, right? Into the step up ball screen. So you see right now, Virginia are in trouble because their bigs pick the wrong side to help, right? But because we've got good pack positioning, right? We're, and again, really good multiple efforts here from the big, right? They're able to close that down really quickly, right? Again, you know, potentially give up a catch and shoot three, but there's a good close out and recovery. And you see this player here, be able to stunt, I'll play, I'll play it again so you can see it in real time. So we've got help, recover, and we've got a stunt. So we call, it's a weird term, we call that a FAT, uh, which stands for fake and threaten. So we fake and threaten at the shooter, right? And we're trying to encourage them to make one extra pass, um, you know, on this play rather than get an open three. Again, you see the nose on low shoulder closeout, right? They've got to throw it back to the top and then the action repeats. So they've got a flare screen, right? And then they do a good job of busting up this ball screen or this pistol action at the end of the clock. Great containment, so no baseline penetration and a really, really good contest to finish the play. Okay, so hope, you know, hopefully everyone's sort of seen some things there, um, you know, that may be of some use. A couple of keys, I think, and I've talked about a lot of this as well, so I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but a couple of keys, um, you know, I think to be successful, especially with your pack defense, um, you know, you can't get stretched. So you've got to have players be disciplined, stay inside the pack. Um, you know, only the player basically that's breaking pack is the player on the ball. Um, one other, you know, exception to that rule is if you're guarding a shooter coming off a, a pin down screen or, you know, a flare screen or something like that, you're allowed to break pack as well um, to be able to do that. Or if you're guarding a player that's going to set a ball screen, obviously you can come out um, and break pack. You know, the key obviously, and this is the best one, is your one-on-one -on -one ball pressure and one-on-one -on -one containment. So again, being able to guard two dribbles without help, 
don't getting beaten in, don't get beaten a straight line. You must be able to send the ball right to the gaps to the help. Um, you know we need effective closeouts. So again, we talked about our details there, right? And again, no baseline drive. So we don't want to give up those split kick extra that baseline drive, baseline drift three, or the amount of times you see that you drive baseline. You know the post has to come over and help. And you give up that dunker spot layup or that uh, D Wade cut layup that a lot of big country teams like. Um, you know we don't want to be put in that situation. Um, you know build your wall, right? And again we want to limit our second movements on our closeouts and our recovery. So you know we talk about our position, so our pack positioning. Um, you know again you've, you've X4 and X3 in that diagram. Um, you know not being caught getting to their spots late. Because, it, you know, we feel like if we have late help on a penetration, our recovery is going to be too late. And that's where we give up, you know, bad, well, bad shots for us, good shots for the offense. Um, you know, and I'll get to this in a moment in a bit more detail. But, you know, I really think, you know, in the modern game, probably 0.7 would have been post defense um, 10 years ago. But I feel like now with basketball, the way it's going, pick and roll defense is one of the most important keys. Um, to what you do. I think, you know, even if you go and watch under 14s games now, you'll probably see one, you know, one pick and roll in most possessions. Um, you know, the higher levels of basketball, you're going to see two and sometimes three that you have to be able to cover. So, you know, it's really important that you drill that every day. Um, you know, your players have great clarity on how you want to defend pick and roll, what your rules are, um, you know, to the point where they're automatic. Um, I'll go quickly through this, but, you know, just as with any defense, um, there's pros and cons. I feel like there's a lot of pros for playing, you know, the pack style of defense. You know, I think the no baseline concept, if you're good at the other details of it, um, is great. Because, like I said, it keeps you out of rotations. I've seen multiple teams I've coached um, be really good at that and really disciplined with that. You are going to give up some points, just as you do with any defense. You might get beat middle or breakdown or something every now and then. But I think the more you take teams away from what they actually want to do, the better it's going to fit your D. Um, you know, protecting the paint, you know, being able to maximise your ball pressure, forcing teams, as you saw in those few clips I showed of my under-17s group, being able to force teams into late clock contested shots. You know, they're the lowest percentage shot in basketball. I think, you, you know, you think about your teams when, if you play with a shot clock, um, that clock gets below eight seconds, your bench start screaming out the time. The coach probably does it. The parents on the sideline do it. So it builds so much extra pressure for, um, you know, teams and, and players having to make those shots when they're under that much pressure. Um, you know, and I really think this defense gives you a chance to compete with more talented teams. So like I said, you, you know, if I'm going to play a, a really aggressive style defense and disrupt passing lanes and gamble for steals and, you know, I'm a no middle team, then I better be really talented and really good at my rotations and my discipline. If we're not, well, then those teams with more talent are going to be able to take advantage um, and put us in tough spots. And I think, I truly think this defense can work, um, you know, at various levels. So, you know, obviously the Boomers use a variation of pack. A lot of NBA teams use variations of that. Um, you know, not my team last year, but the Townsville Fire teams that won championships um, use the pack line defense. Um, Cairns with Aaron Fern in the NBL used it and had success. And like I said before, Virginia in the NCAA uh, won the title last year playing the Pac-1D. Um, some, you know, some cons or negatives, I think. So obviously you have no lane pressure, so it's easy for teams to reverse the ball. So, um, you know, against really sharp teams or teams that execute really well and set screens, um, you know, you could be vulnerable to get given up open shots, um, you know, or allowing them to move the ball a little bit too easy. Right, if you break pack or you're not disciplined, you're obviously going to give up a lot of probably penetration through the elbows, which is never good, um, which leads to you know good shots for the other team. Right, and you have to have full buy-in from your players for it to work. If they don't buy in or they're not committed to you know the multiple effort thing or the full court pickups into the pack positions, um, you know it's just simply not going to work. Uh, and probably one more con that I don't have there is for junior teams to be mindful of. Um, and this is a player development thing. I feel like if you play against teams that are really good and put a lot of pressure on passing lanes against you, you, you probably need to think about the fact that you're not going to be practicing against that type of pressure 
and your players aren't going to be as well as good in the games because they're not used to it. Uh, and just to, I guess, you know, finalise this, I'll show a little bit more video in a second, but I'll just talk about some pick and roll defence. Um, so again, you know, with, with those national teams, we, we kept it quite simple. We didn't have seven or eight ways of guarding the pick and roll. And to be honest, I think unless you've got really smart players, um, I wouldn't recommend having multiple ways of doing it because you can never get good enough at any of them um, to stop the best, to stop the best teams or the best players. So we, you know, on the side pick and rolls, we used a hard show. Um, you know, a couple of key points for us. So, you know, I go back to the earlier slides, you know, the ELC, so early loud continuous talk, right? The bigs or whoever's guarding the screen and must communicate. Um, guards must be able to send their man to the ball screen. So, you know, again, I, I go back to our closeout philosophy. Um, you know, that nose on low shoulder automatically, if it's a side pick and roll, automatically puts us in the right spot to send our man to the screen. Um, you know, if you, if you want to use an ice defense, I wouldn't recommend teaching that type of closeout with an ice because it's too hard, right, to switch your stance and send the ball back down to the baseline. It becomes confusing. Um, so they've got to send it to that and they've got to be able to fight over the top. Uh, the big must be you know, must show aggressively. So we want our big, you see this picture here um, with Blake Griffin, you know, he's coming out hard against the Steph Curry. If he's late, right, or he's detached from his man, right, or his angle isn't quite right and all those little details aren't in the right place, he's going to get split, right, or he's going to get dragged and give up a pick and pop or something to David Lee. So, you know, they must be aggressive. We must have the right angle on our show, which I'll talk about in a minute on the video. Um, and it really helps if you can stay attached to your man before the screen happens. Um, and our weak side defenders, so pick and roll, you know, isn't just guarded by two players. Um, you know, I feel like defensively, it's a five player thing. Everyone has a role. Um, you know, we want to fill the high and low eye. So we clog the floor up as much as we can. And we used a big, big rotation. So we had our, you know, on the side of the floor, we had our other big, if the ball went to the roller or the pick and pop player, we had them rotate over to that player and then our show player rotate to the other big somewhere else on the floor. Um, middle pick and roll, we use what we call wall. Some people call it drops. Um, the boomers, I think, call it mush. Mine, mine's a little bit different to how they did it. I didn't drop the bigs as far back. Um, you know, I've heard it called center field. There's a lot of different terminologies in basketball, which is why, you know, our language needs to be really clear. Again, guards must send the ball to the screen. We must communicate early. Um, against shooters, we'll always go over the top. We don't want to go underneath and let them stop and shoot a three. Um, you know, maybe at lower levels, that's a good strategy, but the higher up you go, players have the ability to do that and you will get penalized. Um, and the bigs on these screens, I teach them to come up to touch, what I call up to touch. So basically, all they want to come up with their man to the point of the screen. And then as the guard starts to use the screen, we'll drop off um, and get into more of a containment stance. And we teach our bigs, as soon as the guard turns the corner um, off the screen, they must have their head between the ball and basket, right? So there's no straight line drive. So that guard has to stop and think about how they're going to attack. Um, and it gives everyone a chance to get into their help positions and be able to contain the screen. Um, on the weak side or off the ball, just like I showed before with the tagging a cutter, um, we'll tag a roller. So we'll tag or stunt to a, a roll, sorry, tag a roller and stunt to a pick and popper, um, which I'll show on the video. And then as I showed on the clip before, late clock, so under eight seconds or less, sometimes it might be 10 seconds or less, uh, we will switch screens, right? And again, we feel like that gives us a great chance late in the clock to build our wall, get into our pack positions, um, and keep that ball on the three-point line as, off, as much as we possibly can. All right. So I'm just going to show a few clips. I'll try and get through these relatively quickly. So, again, this is Virginia in the NCAA. So, again, you know, middle penetration. This is random play. Flows into a side pick and roll. Okay. So you see the offense... <laughs> Right, they've clearly scouted the coverage um, and they're looking to slip out of the screens quickly. Right, but you see here, so Virginia's big. Right, we would teach our big to come and attack the ball. So we want our angle on this to be towards uh, this corner of the court here. Sorry. 
So we'd come out in this direction and try and make this guard dribble away from the basket. So they come out and show, right? You see on this weak side, this is a little bit tricky to defend, but there's a, a flare screen happening here, right? So this guard has to trail over the top of that. We would want our guards to be sinking more in towards, you know, the block and this guard in towards the nail here. Um, but we show and you see it, this low player here, which is the other big on Virginia's team, right? He's already, again, anticipation is key. Right, but he's anticipating this play. And as that ball's in motion towards this player, you see he's now sprinting to cover the roller and the showman now is sprinting back towards the basket to find the other big. Okay, so they do a good job of covering that. Right, they don't give up any advantage to the offense and force them into a tough contested shot. Um, again, see he flows into a side pick and roll. Right, this is the other big here now in this low hole. So this is kind of like, you know, your flow type spacing or a lot of teams in the WNBL are uh, called this one down this year. So where you keep this big low, right? You see their high eye and then they've got protection guy at the back or the low guy at the back, right? Again, that's a, a much better show. So aggressive, right? Attack the point guard, the big slips out of it. And on the flight of the pass, this low player now here is rotating over to cover this. And you see, again, multiple effort plays. So hard show, and now they're sprinting back to find the big. And you see this weak side player now sliding over, right, to protect the basket so there's no quick pass here for a layup, right? And now we've covered that to put out the fire. And again, you know, in the post, we teach wall ups. So like this, two high hands on any, any post shot or any shot around the rim, right? And that's great defense by Virginia, again, to force them into a post hook shot, um, you know, after covering a pick and roll with multiple efforts on the one possession. Okay, now we'll get into a couple of clips. Uh, so this is Spain versus the Boomers in the World Cup semi-final. Unfortunately, Australia lost this game. Um, it was a great game for those that watched it, right? But now you just get to see. So, you know, again, examples of pack type philosophy, um, you know, in place. So this is, you know, big here. So they're sagging, right? You see one pass away. They're, they're not out in the lanes and denying everything. They're more off trying to clog the floor, right? As this pass goes. so. Victor Claver's over here guarding Joe Ingles. So his pack, sorry, his pack position is slightly different because he's guarding a great shooter. And again, I said the higher levels you go up, the better the athleticism, probably the less sagging you're going to get, right? But they're still not out hugging and denying everything. Now, again, the play evolves. So Ricky Rubio is chasing Patty Mills here um, off what they call a gets action, so a, a stationary handoff. Right, which now becomes like a pick and roll. So this is like our wall concept. So Mark Gasol uh, is guarding Aaron Baines. We, again, he's up to touch. Right now, as the ball starts to come off, you see him start to retreat. His head's between the ball and basket. Right, And all the little details here, you know, you see go into a great pick and roll possession. So on the back side, this is what they call the single side. Right, You can see Victor Claver as Baines is rolling now, he's coming into tag. And you can see on what they call this side here, what they call the two side or double side, right? The high player here who's guarding Della Vadova, as Mills is attacking, he's in a stunt, right? And you just see, hopefully the video is working okay, but you just see here, right? There's absolutely nowhere for Patty Mills to go. You know, Rubio's done a really good job of getting his hands up. Claver's had an early tag. So he's got early recovery now back to Joe Ingles, right? So there's no skip pass across the floor. And one detail I, you know, I found really interesting watching this film is you see that Claver actually stays on the line of the ball and his man. So he doesn't sink below that line. He stays on that line. So there's no way Paddy Mills can throw that pass um, without it you know, potentially being stolen. Okay, so they're not scared of throw pass over the top. And because Rubio did a good job with his hands up, right, that pass is going to have to hang in the air for a long time anyway, and it's going to allow them to close out and take away that three. You know, and again, now we get under 10 seconds, right? So the, the play continues, right? And now, again, Australia didn't get an advantage off their first pick and roll, so they go again. And now they get in, Spain get into what they call ice defense, um, where, you know, they send the player away from the screen, so they don't want him to come off and be able to create an advantage. And again, you see Gasol's into his drop, a really aggressive stunt uh, by Rudy Fernandez here. So, you know, he's attacking Mills. And again, Rubio does a great job with his hands 
and gets a deflection and, and snuffs out that play. So, you know, again, it's a really good example, um, you know, of a very, very high level team playing defense. You know, my 17 certainly didn't look like that. None of my other teams have ever really had a, have looked that elite. Um, but again, I just want to show examples where, you know, where it's done really, really well against really high level NBA players um, of what you can achieve if you drill it enough and your players play with discipline. Um, last couple of clips. So I'll show a couple more. Um, you know, again, 17. So, you know, again, this is the same type of thing. It's that same gets type action. You know, we send the ball to the screen. I'd like this guard uh, to be up into the ball handler just a little bit more so they're not as comfortable using their setup move and being able to do that. But luckily for me, I have, you know, great guards and Abby Cabillo does a really good job here of avoiding the screen, right? And you see Ezzy, so she was up to touch and now she's off right into our wall or our, our drop type position. Again, head between ball and basket. Cabillo's done a good job of pursuing the ball and now getting back in front, right? And you see, again, as this roller here is rolling on this weak side, right, with our single side or our tag player, Lucy has done a good job of bumping or tagging that roller, which buys Ezzy, you know, a little bit more time to get back. And now we're into our closeout. Again, two high hands, right? And they throw it in the post, right? You know, seven seconds on the clock. And again, because we've done such a good job all game of disrupting and disrupting and disrupting, they're a little bit sped up. Um, and again, even though we probably don't get as good a wall up on this as we'd like, we love teams taking that shot. Off balance, right-handed jump hook from outside the block, extremely low value. That, you know, that shot at best um, is probably 0.7 points per possession. So we love that. You know, we love the fact that we've made teams take that shot and now we get the rebound, we're off to the races. Um, again, just another example. So Fenerbahce, um, you know, in the full court, Right, little face guard. So their point guard actually took the ball out. So the two guards bringing it up. And you'll see here, just watching this, you know, not a whole lot of heavy pressure, but I can already tell the way this guy's handling the ball. He's not so comfortable. So this is great. Right, again, they turn him. You know, they're stopped at half court to set their offense. You can see now, because the point guard didn't get the ball back, there's confusion. Right, now this team's a little more disrupting with us. So they're out contesting. They push the ball out beyond the three-point line. Right, and then again, your multiple actions come in. So there's definitely confusion here. Right, the big comes over. Their spacing is not good right here. And again, you see it allows a pack help type position, a little stunt, two hands on the closeout after the pick and roll. And I love this from the big. So quick show here from Jan Vesely. Right, and you just watch here what he does with his hands. So they're straight up in the air. So there's no way that pass is going to the paint. Again, keeps the ball on the perimeter. And now your multiple efforts. So now this is the second pick and roll in the possession. Right, again, they wall it. Right, and it's a pick and pop. So you'll see here, wall, they, st they go back and recover. And you'll see this guy one pass away, a great stunt to take away the three. Right, and then again, you see on the recovery, the two high hands. So... The hands are up. They're doing a great job battling here down low in the post. So Vesely's made multiple efforts again, right? And you'll see, right, they get absolutely nothing. Four and a half seconds left. The ref calls a three-second violation. So, you know, just another example with some slightly different uh, concepts and philosophies of, you know, what high-level defense can look like when executed, um, you know, properly. So um, I'll just switch my screens up um, that's basically all that I all I had there's a couple other things I could have spoke about but I think that's probably enough um, you know I don't know if anybody has any questions or Reese. I might be going over time um, and it's probably just a, just turn. a tad mate just a tad um, but all all very good stuff um, coaches will get a lot out of that so um, there is a there is a, a bunch of questions come in and we had the same thing last week the coaches seem to uh Really want a lot of ask ask a lot of questions on the defensive end, so I'll, I'll try and get through a couple of them. But obviously cognizant of time, and want to get Paul up to present on um, his pick and roll defensive coverages. So, a um, couple of quick ones, mate. Um, do do you have ever you ever had, ever had any issues um, late game, or if you've got to change your defense, um, you've been a you know pack team. But you've got to go to something more aggressive. You've got to get in the lanes and disrupt. Has that ever been a challenge for your team because they're so well drilled on the pack? Um, 
to, to turn it on in those crucial situations where you've got to change the tempo or go more aggressive? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, well, I would say probably the number one thing with that is so, you know, what, what we try and do, and to be honest, I, you know, I didn't do a good enough job of this last season, but we'll practice a lot of late game scenarios. So, you know, we might, we might sort of, you know, and I'm going to meet with my assistant coaches in a couple of weeks, probably once the, um, you know, I guess social distancing thing is done and, and whatever and have a beer. But, um, but yeah, we'll probably sit down and talk about a lot of different late game scenarios we want to be prepared for. And that'll be one of them. So, you know, if we're down 10 points or seven points with two minutes to go or three minutes to go or whatever it is, what things we need to prepare our team to do to give ourselves a chance to catch up. And that would definitely be one of them. So, you know, if we're down 10, you know, we're probably going to look to leverage, you know, our full court aggression a lot more. Um, you know, we may look to disrupt by switching a lot more and things like that. And we might also, you know, have to work on situations where maybe, you know, if we're playing uh, Gurry with Canberra and we're guarding Kia Nurse or, you know, someone like that, we might go f a full face guard and have to come out of pack and deny them. You know, I know Townsville... Um, when they played Perth in the finals a few years ago uh, in the grand final, they played a player named Sam Whitcomb who, you know, can light it up and score 35 on any given night. They actually broke pack for her. So they drilled, you know, within their practices, playing pack with four players. Um, so they break pack to deny the, you know, I guess the superstar or the key player um, and the rest of the team played the same pack principle. So that's probably what I would look to do. Um, you know, I think late in games, you want to try and make, maybe teams lesser, you know, less talented or less creative players make the plays and keep the ball out of the better players' hands. And I think that gives you a chance to, you know, get stops and get yourself back in games. For sure, for sure. Um, similarly, I mean, you know, you're always going to give up something, but, um, you know, you hustle or you switch late clock. Um, and you said that you think that's quite effective. Do you find there's challenges with the rebounding mismatch at times? Yeah, definitely. So one one of the things, um, you know, I like we didn't have that issue with the 17s, um, but we had really good rebounding guards. So, um, you know, like Jasmine Simmons, who's at Oregon State, she's probably she. I think she had 15 and 17 rebounds in a semi and final or quarter and final, something like that. So, you know, she was a great rebounder, and quite often it was her or Jazz Shelley um, switching those pick and rolls. You know, what I would probably um, encouraging there's lots of video out there you can find but one thing I would incorporate now into into that scheme is three-way switching um, so you know we're basically you have say if it's my point guard it's a five foot five point guard um, switching onto a five man late in the clock we would actually try and have you know one of the bigs or one of the bigger guards on the weak side switch over and yep. kick them out to a perimeter player just so if they do take that three-point shot you know we've got a bigger body to block out um, but probably the other thing that I would say on that is contested long jump shots usually mean long rebounds. So, you know, we're able to pick up a lot of points off the glass and leak out and actually got, like, Jazz Simmons would have had three or four layups on her own off of defensive rebounds because they were that long and triggered a fast break. So, you know, we did, I've never really found it be, um, you know, a massive issue. Yeah. Um, for the coaches, Paul is actually going to present a little bit on the three-way switching, so you get to see a little bit of that. Um, later on, maybe about 11 o'clock tonight after Shannon's presentation. So, um, sorry, mate. sorry. No, for no. <laughs> um, no, it was very good. A um, couple more. Would you change your philosophy? Um, would it change much if you weren't playing with a shot clock? You're a junior coach um, and then you happen to play in a league that doesn't have a shot clock, or would you stay with the same um, sort of philosophy? Obviously, you won't have the eight seconds, but um, just a question from a, a junior coach. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it depends It depends what we're talking about here. If it's, you know, um, like, I'll be honest, I think with junior basketball, like, say, under 12s, 14s especially, um, I would actually be teaching kids to play denial defense mm -hmm. because I think it helps their offensive skill as well. So I'd be looking at that. Um, you know, but I think if you're going to go with the pack or that's your belief or system and you want to use it with young players or leagues with no shot clock, I still think it's okay. I think the one thing you have to really sell to your players and demand is the ball pressure. Yeah. You know, I think if you pressure the ball really heavily, um, you know, you're going to force teams into putting the ball in the deck and making out of control plays or taking quick shots. 
um, which then negates the you know their ability to hold the ball or whatever it may be. You know, and as the first question, if you end up you're down ten with two minutes to go, well, you'd be silly to sit back and sag it. You know, sag in and play pack. If you need the ball back, you need to get more aggressive and try and disrupt. For sure, for sure. Uh, how do you crowd staggered screens? Uh, staggered. So again, it's per you know personnel based. Um, you know, if we're guarding. You know, like there's a lot of that in WNBL this year. And what I what I find helpful, so, you know, with a staggered screen, uh, and hopefully people maybe can visualise this, is we teach a lot of stuff with screens to gap and get through. Um, and I would still do that on staggers. If I'm guarding Kia Nurse, I would lock and trail and have my big at the, or the screen and defender at the top in that drops type position so she can't catch and go or catch and curl. I'd lock and trail Kia Nurse. But anyone else we'd probably trail the first screen to stay attached to their body. And then the second screen we would gap and get through. So we feel like that, you know, that gives us a great opportunity to keep our shape and stay with our pack philosophy. You know, if I'm locking and trailing and I'm getting behind players or things like that, I'm allowing a lot of downhill penetration from the top of the floor, um, which we don't necessarily want. Yeah, and again, a lot of people worry about gap and go under because of the flare, but if there's ball pressure, back to what you were talking about at the start, that's going to really limit that and make that a tough skip pass. So Exactly right. Um, yeah. Um, you're in your full court, uh, you're man-to-man, you're up the floor. Uh, you said you're often your four is your plugger. Uh, what if a guard takes it out, a two or a three, um, and they inbound? How does it sort of change? Yep, so uh, there's a couple of clips in there. So usually we'll just, we'll sort of, teach initially the players just to match up um if we if i have a really athletic four man or say i've got a, a decent sized group so maybe my two and three are like a jazz semi like a bigger guard a more strong athletic guard and i really back my four man's ability to plug and disrupt and fake trap and stunt and things like that we may like with that 17s group with kira Rowe, we just told anytime she was on the floor she was always going to plug Yep. And, uh, you know, and Kabila or Conti were always going to be the dog. And then the other three players, because we did such a good job of getting on the inbound and slowing that first couple of seconds down, the other three players have time to talk their matchups and, and get organised as well. Yep. Cool. Um, what does the rotation look like in the half court, quarter court, if the pack does get broken? So it's a middle drive, you know, out of position close out. Um, how does that look on a middle penetration? Yep, definitely. So that's a really good question, um, and I'll talk about that. But firstly, one of the things that I'm really big on, um, because this is one of the things you'll find with players, just WNBL players, but players in general, is all players are always looking for, you know, or what if, or but what, but if this happens, or but that, but what if that. And I, I'm really big on, you know, like if we if we execute our philosophy well, like if you say in that example, if you close out properly and the player next to you gets in their gap properly and I can guard two dribbles because we've drilled it at practice every single day, that situation will not happen very often. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and that's what we'll always look at when we review film and they'll say, oh, but how do we rotate? We'll always take it back to the start and we'll see where the problem occurred. So most people look at it and say, oh, the problem was we didn't have a rotation. I'll look at it and say the problem was we didn't contain or we didn't jump to the ball quickly enough to clog the floor. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing with that is usually what we would do, um, you know, is, is pretty similar to a normal rotation. So normally if, if it's an emergency or we absolutely have to come off and help, we would, the lowest player would rotate up to the ball. Um, you know, say it's a, there's a corner and a, a wing or a corner and a seam and the penetrations come from the opposite wing or opposite seam the lowest player would rotate up towards the ball to stop the ball. The next player would sink to cover the corner and the guard that got beat would rotate to the player on the wing or the seam at the top. So, so it, would it would never be from one pass away completely committing to the ball? No, not, not really. Because, again, that's something I've, I actually have clips I was going to show of examples <laughs> of that, which I'm going to experiment with. Um, they do it in, a lot in Europe. They call it next defence or... Some people call it wall defense where they do rotate one pass away. I never have yeah. um, because I think it's something that's going to take a lot of drilling. And I think, say, if I'm, com if I'm coming off Kia Nurse, you know, to help and stop the ball, I better be damn sure that my teammate is going to be rotating straight to her um, so we're not giving up a wide open three that's worth, you know, 
1.6 points every possession. For sure. Um, th there was one other question, but I think you already answered about youth development. Do you just go with pack or do you balance denial? I think you sort of already covered off on that and obviously cognizant of the time. But, um, you know, really appreciate the detail, Shannon, that you put together for the coaches. And I know they'll all appreciate that and we'll um, get this online and get this out to them. I think they'll... Um, you know, they've sort of seen how you how you go about it and how you build it up and the detail and the thought process that goes into it. Um, so I think, yeah, every coach tonight will, will get a hell of a lot out of that. And I don't think there'll be anyone complaining that it went longer. It was um, it was great stuff. It was just me because I told Except you. Except yeah, Gory, Gory and me because I told you had half an hour. You took an hour 15. But other than that, <laughs> um, we're all good. So the only other thing is I've got a few messages saying that you said uh, in a couple of weeks when this coronavirus stuff's done and I think you're a bit crazy about that but um fingers crossed mate and we'll be back at it but thanks for that that was um awesome stuff Shannon no no worries Reese. thanks a lot for having me no worries um now we'll just move into um Gorry's presentation just quickly um have to talk Gorry up because um he certainly won't himself um <laughs> um he obviously current strain opens assistant coach um uh, Canberra Capitals back-to-back -back championship winning coach at the AAS um, for you know 10-15 years including being the head coach of the women's program um, one of the best player development coaches in the country there's no doubt um, also knows his coffee and all these other things he's a great guy um, so you know, I'm sure he's uh, he's got a great presentation on pick and roll defense and will certainly challenge um, a lot of us and, and give some different ideas um, so I think that's enough from me. I think I'll hand over to, to Gory to let him um, go through his presentation. Thanks, Reese. Uh, hopefully this will come up now. Um, just like I guess Shannon said is I've been able to work with a lot of like very good coaches that have shaped how I teach and coach the game, but also I've had an influence uh, in the pick and roll stuff that I've done. And some of this is with, uh, you know, in, with some of the working with some of those coaches across my many years at like AIS and in the WNBL, but also now working with the Opals with Sandy Brondello. So it's not just my thoughts and my ideas. It's a lot of other people that I've got from, you know, coaching in the WNBL, coaching in Siebel um, and coaching within the national program. Uh, and I would say to like start with is I don't think there is any right or wrong way. It's about what suits your group and how you want to coach it and how you want to teach it. And so, I've got a PowerPoint presentation plus some video that I'd like to talk to, um, but obviously we can ask questions as we go along. We'll leave them to the end. Um, so to start with, I guess, is you know defending the pick and roll. Number one thing is what do you do with the ball handler or what's their role in regards to the pick and roll scheme? So the first thing is, as Reese spoke about, is we must have ball pressure. So the earlier that you can pick up the ball, it doesn't need to be full court pickup, but the earlier that you can pick up the ball, if it's in the full court or it must be picked up as soon as it comes over halfway. So you must have ball pressure. Otherwise, as you'll see in some of the clips that I've got, uh, you'll get hit on screens. Uh, so there's the number one thing is when you're defending a pick and roll, whoever the ball handler is, they must have pressure on that ball handler. Uh, the second thing is the ability to be able to like listen. And this is something that I constantly go through uh, with our WNBL team with the caps is you not only have to hear it, you've got to be able to like listen to what the big screen defender is calling out to you. So they'll give you direction to whether you're to go under, through, gap, whatever it may be, but you've got to be able to listen to that call and then act on it. So listening is a huge part of, you're not just in your own silo playing your own thing, you've got to be able to hear what the screen defender is giving you instruction to do. Um, the third thing, which I think is a challenging thing, is changing stance. So regardless of whether you're, you know, push baseline, push middle, or your square stance to the wall, uh, it's an important thing of when you hear that the screen is coming, whichever way it's coming, that you're changing stance. And that might be changing stance to push towards a screen if it was a hard show or a quick show, or changing your stance to be able to force away in an ice situation. And I think you'll see, once again, in some of our clips, that it's a really important thing that you've got to be able to drill is the ability to be able to like change stances for the person guarding the ball. And then three things that I've, I've gotten and I've used before is the three A's, which is anticipate. So anticipate knowing that there may be a drag screen or a step up screen coming, knowing what the scout is in regards to that 
uh, individual player and what their tendencies are that, you know, where the, what they like to do out of a pick and roll scheme. Uh, agility, the ability, as we spoke about, to change stance, but get your body either over, through or under whatever the scheme may be. And you've got to be able to do that quickly. So agility comes into play as far as, you know, players have to be fit to be able to play multiple screening actions and to be able to defend multiple screening actions. And then the ability to be able to avoid the screen, so not running into the screen. So you might have to run, slide, get back in front or not get hit by the screen. And same thing again is the ability to be able to navigate and negotiate. You've got to have that agility to be able to avoid the screen first off so you can't just be hit on screens. Uh, and the third part of that is we talk to or I talk to my group a lot about having active hands. So as soon as you come over the screen, you must have your hands in the air. Uh, number one thing is to stop a throwback or a kickback pass. Secondly is if you're down in a good stance and your hands are up, you're forcing a contested layup. Um, so we talk about that if you get over screens, your number one thing is to get your hands up, to stop throwback passes or kickback passes, but to also stay in your stance and force a contested layup or to be able to get back in front um, and one of the things that Sandy Brondello talks about a lot is about staying in plays. So is if you get over the screen and you're right on their hip, then stay in the play and force them to shoot a contested layup. But at the end of that is having good foul discipline at the same time. So I've just put in those dot points about what are, I think some key components to defending the ball handler in a pick and roll situation. The next part is for the screener in a pick and roll uh, is the communicating it early, um, early and loud. And so that gets back to what Shannon's points were about communication. The earlier you call it, that the screen and the ball handler defender can change their stance and be ready to negotiate to whatever scheme that you've got. So communication early and loud is number one. And then trying to navigate and push the screener either higher and wider than where they want to set it. So it changes either you know, the height, if it's above the three-point line, trying to push that higher and wider or changing the angle of the screen so it's not where they want to be able to set the pick-and-roll screen. For the bigs in it, um, Sandy talks about this a lot, being at the point of the screen, and that's different if you're in an ice situation, but if you're in a hard show or you're in a soft show, that you have to be at the point of the screen, and, and I'll show you what I mean uh, by that in our video sessions, but it's a it's a very important part that if you're going to be aggressive in your screen, that the bigs have to actually be at the point of the screen to take away the ball handler turning the corner. The other part is being big. So if there is a emergency switch or you do have to come off and the bigs have to guard the guards, that they're big and they take up space and use their length and use their size and athleticism. So taking up space, not only with their hands, but having the appropriate angles with their feet uh, and having hand pressure coming off it. Then the ability, like with the guards, the agility, the ability to be able to recover quickly and throwing their hands up. So as soon as they recover, it's hands up, just like the guards would do, and having good foul discipline at the end of the play. Uh, the other part to end it is communicate late, because if there is separation uh, and it causes a switch, the big has to be the one talking to the guard. So the key components for them are to be able to communicate early, but also to be able to communicate late uh, on any of those pick and roll schemes. Okay, some uh, just teaching uh, points and breakdowns, uh, and I'll go over these as we go through the video. I haven't actually got video of, of, our, of our capitals doing any of this, but off ball positioning, so it's not only uh, the two people that are involved in the pick and roll, it's off ball positioning is, is really important to however, whatever scheme that you do. And so with our group, when we do uh, or teach a new scheme or break down schemes, we do it two on two. So primarily don't have any help defense. Uh, they have to do it two on two. So whether it's just a hard show, a quick show, an ice situation, we go through two on two. So they just get repetition and muscle memory and obviously reps of being able to do that scheme over and over till they feel comfortable in changing their stance, getting over the screen, where their foot angles are, where their hand pressure is. So I think it's important that you start at that two on two level before you actually start building it up to getting it to your deemed defense. So you break it down uh, and then build it up. 
We then go to two on three, so two offense with three defenders. So having your help defender, whether it be in the low help spot or the high help spot at the nail, uh, so they can build some trust about where the help is in behind the ball. And then we build it into a shell drill type scenario uh, and talking about our stunting, which as Shannon alluded to, we use that and Sandy uses that a lot in her verbal cues with the opals is stunning is just uh, hedging and recovering back. Tagging is, is bumping and we talk a lot about loading up in behind the ball. So just having good floor position behind the ball defensively. So you've got the nail, the low help and where you are off the ball, depending on whether it's a shooter opposite in the corner or high. Uh, and then obviously your positioning changes depending on how aggressive you are in your pick and roll scheme. So if you're in a, a hard show where it's really aggressive, you can tend to be further away from the ball. But if you're more in a soft defensive scheme, you might be in a quick show, then you need to be more loaded up towards the ball where there might be situations where you need to help a little bit more on that. Uh, if you're in a side pick and roll uh, and there's a nail and a low help, there's always the opportunity that we have to be in a side pick and roll. Our option is we always must have a high and a low help in regards to that offense. And we'll see that in some of the video clips. But going back to where we said about the, the two on three and loading up and having extra defense, it's about creating confidence by the players in outnumbered situations. So you want to be able to put the defense in situations where at practice they feel comfortable that what their role is and how they're performing that role, that they've got confidence in behind both the ball and their man about where their positioning is. Uh, and we talk a lot about off the ball, it's not only about the position, but you have to see what the person with the ball is doing. So if they bring it above their head, then you can creep back closer to your player. If they're down in the driving stance and the ball's in their pocket and they're ready to drive, then you can like load up and come closer towards the ball. Uh, and we also practice a lot of uh, two-way switching and three-way switching, which we'll see uh, on the video. But I think it's an important thing that, uh, you know, people or coaches, players tend to think that two-way switching is easy. It's, it's not so easy when you're dealing with, you know, great players in the WNBL like Lindsay Allen and Leilani Mitchell who are great pick and roll players that you've got to be able to practice uh, two-way switching and three-way switching where bigs have to be able to play one-on-one -on -one against a good guard and the littles have to actually go down and defend a post if they get rolled down on. Uh, and my last point in all of these breakdowns is when we're teaching and going through, whether it may be scout or we're looking at an opposition team, is it's not always going to be perfect. We always look for the perfect situation, but I think you've got to have in the back of your mind about what are you prepared to give up. So we go with our players about this is the number one priority in our pick and roll scheme that we're prepared to give this up. So uh, once again, you'll see in some of the video when we play uh, against Southside Flyers, we play against Lay, who I've had the, you know, opportunity to to coach a great player, and Lay, who's a great pick and roll player. Our stuff is, you know, we're prepared to give up other shots to other people, but we've got to try and get the ball out of Lay's hands and show her different looks. So, I think you've always got to have it in the back of your mind to be able to help coach your players and teach them the way. Is about well, we're prepared to give up this but our non-negotiable is going to be whatever that may be. And, and we'll show some of the clips of what we do with the capitals in regards to some of those non-negotiables and what we give up in certain situations or with different personnel. Uh, the last slide is about like tactics. So, so what I just spoke about is like having it in the back of your mind about when you're coaching these things about giving your players, I guess, the opportunity to be able to have that one thing about we're not going to give up this. So whether it's Lindsay Allen with Melbourne Boomers, we changed in game three about we weren't going to let her get feet inside the paint. So we were going to allow kick out threes and to give her mid-range jump shots, but we weren't going to allow her to get feet inside the paint. And um, that was something that was communicated to our, our playing group very early on when we did prep for our team about this is what we can't have. So that was a non-negotiable. If we get beaten on a kick out three, We'll live with that, but we can't let Lindsay Allen come and get feet inside the paint. The things to consider about tactics within your own teams, about um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the individual opponent or the team that you're going to play against. So 
you know, are there strengths in that they want to get off the pick and roll and get feet inside the paint to get layups or are they use and pick and roll soft to get kick out threes and move you and get into split kick extra pass. So I think that comes into some of your scouting about who you're playing against and what the, the strengths are and those players both in the guard position and the big position in what their skill sets are. Uh, the next one, um, play to the strengths of your own individuals and your own team. And I guess that's what um, it's kind of 50-50 with us. We're mindful of who we're playing against about what their strength and weakness is. But also with us, um, we tend to play to the strengths of what our own personnel is. So someone like, for us with the Capitals, Mariana Tolo is a great, you know, hard show or hard hedge player. So we allow her to, to be that player because we know that's a strength of hers and that's what she likes doing. In regards to, say, Kelsey Griffin, uh, a little bit more mobile and can defend guards. So she's into more of, like, we allow her to switch more in pick and rolls because she can defend those guards coming off those screens. Uh, someone like this season with Olivia Rapupa, um, small, tiny guard, we wouldn't let her switch with someone like Kelsey at times, just purely because we didn't have the ability of having her go down and defend uh, uh, Abby Bishop or um, you know Mercedes Russell out of Southside and playing her one-on-one -on -one down the low post. So we would come up with different schemes for those. Obviously, having plan A is important, and that's what you, you practice and go through with your scouting. But you must have, I think, a plan B to go to, but spend most of your time being able to implement plan A and doing that well. I think that most, you know, most players, as Shannon alluded to, what the what if, what but, what happens if is I think do one thing well and do it well and then you've always got a backup plan to go to, but you've got to hang your hat on something and do, do that thing, whatever it may be, do it well. Uh, and then obviously you've got on the next thing about what about all these different types of screens you're going to encounter. What are you going to do off a drag screen out of transition? What are you going to do off a double drag screen that's high out of transition? There's step up screen, side pick and roll, middle pick and roll, seam screen, and what do you do late clock and or end of quarter. So there's all those kind of schemes that you've got to think about how you want to approach those with your own teams. And there's a lot of different pick and roll schemes, but I would say early on, um, going back to the point before, is keep it simple and do one thing and try and do that thing well because it's not only, you know, you've got to work with the two people in the pick and roll, it's about being able to get those people off the ball positions to be able to do their job at the same time. Uh, and, you know, having a look at teams that you may be scouting or playing against, you know, some teams are very early pick and roll teams that want to score on that first eight seconds. Some may use pick and roll in the middle of the clock just to be able to use it as, you know, moving the ball and getting through offense to get to a late pick and roll. Uh, so you want to handle those situations differently and how you manage I guess, the shot clock with your pick and roll schemes. And then having the ability to go to a plan B or to go to something that you might have up your sleeve, whether it's a trap or an ice that you can change at um, after a timeout or a quarter time, or you can change just for different personnel. Uh, and just my last point there about how we change tactics for game three of the semifinal against Melbourne. Um, they tore us apart in game two with Lindsay Allen and pick and roll. Uh, and so we went into, we had one practice session to practice ice uh, for game three. Um, you know, we had to break it down, put it into practice, you know, very short, limited turnaround from game two to game three. And it was something that we hadn't done all season. But it was like going back, breaking it down, getting our off-ball positioning right and just building, I guess, trust and faith in what we had was going to work. Uh, and that took some time, both, you know, showing it on video, breaking it down for the players and then executing it in the game. We knew it wasn't going to be perfect, but what we were going to do was commit to it. And, you know, it was interesting because once we got through it, you get players ask, well, what if it doesn't work? What's plan B? What's plan C? I made it quite clear that there wasn't a plan B or plan C that we were going to commit to it and we were going to do it well. And I think that built confidence within our group that we were going to have a go at something that we hadn't done before that was, you know, a little bit out of the box for our group. But we had enough trust that we had the, 
the veteran leadership and we'd had enough practice time in only an hour to be able to get it done and that we were going to commit to it and have a go. So and I think that's the ability that you've got to have as a coach to be able to implement it, uh, trust the players and let them work their way through it at times, knowing that it's not going to be perfect uh, and knowing that you have going to have to change things on the fly and be flexible with how you implement those things. Uh, so I'll just go into... Um, Gory, I might just throw a couple of questions already yes, um, yep. and rather do them all at the end. Yep. Um, so from a junior perspective, if you had to recommend one um, pick and roll coverage that you think is good from a development perspective, what would you encourage coaches to work on with their um, youth or development teams? I think the, the easy thing would be to, I guess, switch. Um, but to me, switching can become lazy. And um, with our group, we took part way through the season, I, I took switching away because we became lazy with it. I think from a junior perspective, uh, switching would be easy. Uh, if I had my time back over again, uh, with juniors especially, I would teach hard show. Uh, yeah. Just I don't think that juniors right now have the ability to be great pick and roll players with their ability to be able to can they use a pick and roll? Have they got the ability to be able to pass, shoot and dribble off a pick and roll and make decisions off that? Um, so in short, I would probably teach hard show. Yep, cool. Um, what's more important to you in pick and roll uh, communication? Is it more important for it to be efficient um, or loud and continuous? Uh, loud and continuous. Yep. Um, and we have different things with, and we have a we had a team discussion about this with the caps because different people like different things. So someone like Kia was, I just need to know whether it's left or right, and you tell me whether to get over. Yep. Um, that's what communication she wanted. Other people like Ollie, um, she wanted left right, and whether it was hard show or ice, so she knew with to change the stance and which way to go. Um, I, I think it's something that you've got to sit down and discuss with your players, but I think early, loud and continuous is, is the way to go. Yep. Perfect. Um, from a scouting perspective, do you often have um, different coverages for different players? So you sort of spoke about you're often better off being simple, um, but do you sometimes have different coverages for different players? You know, if it's a superstar yeah. or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Like we try and keep it, um, as simple as we can um, with WNBL and even with, with Opals. Um, we try and keep it as simple as we can. I would say quite openly that in WNBL, um, once again, going back, Lindsay Allen and Lay um, are two pains in the asses to play against in pick and roll because they're two great players and can play it very well. We had different schemes for them compared to the rest of the team. Um, just purely because of their ability to be able to use the pick and roll and trying to get the ball out of their hands. Um, with the Opals, we have different schemes for Liz compared to everywhere else. Um, so Liz is more in a, we don't call it drops, but Liz is more in a drops or a quick show or a soft show compared to what we would have with Kayla, George, Ezzy, Tolo uh, in a pick and roll scheme. Yeah, for sure. That's good. Um, Last one before we sort of get into your video, because I want to uh, get into that. Um, yeah. There's a lot coming through. So um, I'm trying to balance that. Um, you spoke about your breakdown drills, uh, a lot about that. Um, how long would you spend um, on, a, on each breakdown drill per session? Um, would you pick a couple to work on for training? And then how long, how much time are you allowed? Yeah, I'm, uh, as I say, it's like, I don't think, and I say this to like coaches, if they want to come along and watch our practice sessions for caps is like, they're not sexy. They're nothing new as we spend, I'd say at least half of our time on shell drill, breaking down shell drill, four on four, breaking down one on one, two on two, three on three uh, with, you know, ball pressure, hand pressure, where are your feet? Where's the help? What are you reading off the ball? Um, and so, you know, we spend, I, I think I spend, um, and I think Jenny Lonigan's on here so she can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I think we, we spend probably more time loaded up to the defensive side of things and breakdown drills for practice and what we do offensively. Because I think unless you get your feet right, your hand pressure right, where you want to force the ball, 
where you want to off ball, have position, where you want to talk from, where you're going to rotate to, unless you break like down those things is you're going to leave yourself open for a lot of like what ifs, what buts, where's help, where's rotation coming from. Um, so we spend, I think, a, a proportionate amount of time loaded up to, to defense. Um, last year, even though we had, um, when we won, we had a veteran group with Kelsey, Kelly Wilson, Lay, Tolo, um, probably the back end, the last six weeks of the season leading into the playoffs and finals, we've spent probably 70% of the time on defense. Yeah. Yeah. And is it um, long periods of time? Is it short bites on, you know, little concepts? I think, yeah. So for, on, for with our shell stuff, we spend, I, I guess, probably five minutes on the back end of the season just with positioning hand pressure where our feet are placed. And then we build it up into, we have a little package into pick and roll, into baseline penetration, middle penetration. And then there's like two stops and get out. Um, so we kind of like go in five minutes of, you know, just getting our positioning right with our hand pressure and where's our feet positioned and where's our off ball positioning. And then we kind of play for two stops and then change teams up. So it's kind of like quick bites once we get into the season. Early on in the season, it'll be more about teaching. But once we're in and going, it's more about refining it and going short, sharp, little bites on it. Yep. No, that's perfect, mate. It certainly answers a lot of the questions for the coaches. And I can attest to you do shell drill more than any coach I've ever seen. So, <laughs> um, I, I will, yeah, and I will say is like going back to, um, and I, I, I guess I value defense more than offense. That's just the way I've always been wired as a coach. But when I coached the under-19 team, um, we went to world champs and we had 45 minutes um, practice session every day. Um, and this was with um, Dee Butler and John O'Goodman as we had 45 minutes of practice every day before our game. And uh, we cordoned off five to 10 minutes of that 45 minutes every day was shell drill, uh, mm -hmm. just because I thought it was important in the players getting repetition and because it's, I, I think it's always something that if you value it and you preach it, then you've got to coach it and you've got to teach it and you've got to spend time on it. I value it like I say to coaches at times, they, coaches say, we want to be a running team. And I'm like, well, okay, how much time do you actually spend in your coaching session yeah. doing offensive transition drills? Like if I want to say I'm a defensive coach, then I, I want to spend a proportionate amount of time coaching defense and getting that right and being good at it. For sure. Uh, that's great, mate. Thanks for that. That's all right. Um, I'll just now flip over to the video. Can you see that now? Can everyone see that? Okay. So we'll go into the video. I'll try and play this at, at slow-mo speed. Um, hey, Gary, we don't yeah. have it yet, mate. We don't, don't have, have it. it. Go to the share screen. Uh, share, yeah. And then you change it at the top. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Should be able to change it. Yeah, that's now coming that, up. Yeah. Now you got that? Yep. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, so I've split these um, into, I guess, different types of screens that you're going to, like, encounter. And, you know, as I said, nothing's right or wrong, but this is how we defend it um, as, as caps, and this is what I coach uh, in the WNBL. Some of this is... Obviously, what I've learned through other coaches and definitely with, with Sandy, with the um, Opals team and how we defend some pick and roll situations and using some of uh, her terminology so it flows on effect into WNBL and to our players that are part of the national team. So drag screens, so those running screens uh, into transition that we have and play against. Uh, so here is straight away once the ball crosses halfway, um, we're in an ice. So automatically, Olivia's changed her stance to be try and force Lindsay Allen to the sideline. Tolo, as it plays out, now gets to that plug spot like Shannon told, talked about, but now our plug spot is actually in the quarter court. And so now you can see Olivia is now going, you're not going to go middle. We're forcing you away from using the screen. Tolo's trying to get there and be big. What well, we talk about being big, so hands up, feet are wide, presenting. And I talk about um, just not only in this screening situation, but also off the ball, I use the terminology a lot, is showing a crowd behind the ball. 
So we want to crowd the ball both on it and behind it. And so here, as it goes down, Tolo does a good job of presenting herself and showing a crowd and showing a front to Lindsay Allen. And we, I switched this. So whenever Kayla, because she was a great pick and pop player, but we wanted to make sure we were sending a player to Lindsay Allen, as I said before, about keeping her from getting feet inside the paint. And, you know, one of the best defenders in the WNBL being in front of you that's got long reach and good arm span. And Olivia now takes the pick and pop player. And now you can see here now Maddie Rochi does a good job of stunting and then playing in the lane on this next reversal. So Tolo has now taken away Lindsay Allen's straight line drive. Kelsey took away the low helps so and no easy post catch. So we've stopped them and limiting their points in the paint. And Olivia is now chasing out where now Kayla feels very uncomfortable having to play against a point guard out on the perimeter. So right away, we've done our job in stopping uh, Lindsay Allen getting feet inside the paint. So that's kind of like an ice switch. So ice again. So here now, Tolo, and that's why I say it is like we had one day to put this in and coach it with our group. Tolo's position is not great. Uh, Maddie's doing the right thing here. Uh, Kia needs to be more of on the lane line here. Kelsey's fine because they're in here. Olivia can drop down into here. But right now we're beat because we're not in a good ice position where Tolo's protecting the paint and showing a crowd to Lindsay Allen. So now what it becomes is, same thing, I have a thing of if the shit hits the fan, if there's separation, then we have to switch. So now Tolo now sees that there's separation, that Maddie hasn't been able to cut off Lindsay Allen or keep her in front or stay in the play. So Maddie's no longer being able to stay in the play. So now Tolo's now had to switch. So now our thing is hands up, chest up and stay in plays with good foul discipline. You can see here now Maddie's seen it, so she's not running out because Lindsay Allen hasn't had eyes for the ball. He has taken away the corner three. Vitolo does an excellent job of just walling up, and she's a great shot blocker and great defender, but does a good job of walling up and, and blocking the shot by just staying in the play and having good foul discipline. So while it wasn't perfect, our communication and our willingness to get there quick took us out of being able to give up a straight line drive to the basket. And so we have the rule of there's any separation, it's an automatic switch. So here, when we spoke about uh, obviously like scout, and this is not necessarily a drag screen out of, out of transition, but it's a drag screen nonetheless in where it's a seam and now it's different because there is a person in the loaded corner. So Alex Delaney, what we call, is in an open stance because she's helping both the ball defender and helping on the roll. Now, with Nicole Seacamp up here, we know she's a great right-hand driver. So our rule was her was any time we can push her left and keep her left, we did it. Tolo was doing the right thing here because our structure here was Tolo was in a quick show. But Olivia is seeing that there's an opportunity to force Nicole Seacamp and keep it to a left, which is a non-prepared hand. So Olivia now stays in plays. You see Alex has done a great job here in presenting a crowd. Her hands could be up higher and wider, but she does a good job of stunting and staying in that space and recovering to a three-point shooter out here. Kia does a good job in presenting a crowd in behind the ball. But Ollie does an excellent job of staying in plays. We had good help and recover. Tolo's in a good position where she wants to come back to a right hand that she's helping inside on that drive. Ollie, great ball pressure, and we force it to kick them out to a contested three. So yet, yet again, um, like Shannon spoke about, we have certain things that we want to keep our teams to as far as, or opposition teams to as far as points in the paint. Uh, another drag screen situation here, obviously, Lay, as I've spoken about, one of the best ball screen players, I, I think, in the world, regardless of male, female, just a great pick and roll player. Tolo does a good job of creating a front, so we want to stop Lay from getting like feet inside the paint, force her to throw it out rather than score with the ball. 
Here, Maddie does a good job of stunting inside and out. So we're all presenting a crowd to Leilani that, you know, we're going to make somebody else beat us, not Leilani beat us. Now, as we roll through, now our rule should be Leilani's taken a step back. She's taken a dribble back and retreated. Now, Maddie gets back to hers. Tolo should be getting back to Mercedes Russell. But Tolo being a little bit slow on this, so she hasn't moved on the flight time of the ball, gives up that shot. Now, while you kind of like go, that's not perfect for us and our team with our scouting and what we wanted, everyone did their job perfectly because we were prepared. That's what I said. That was our non-negotiable. Lay doesn't get an open shot or an open look at the rim or an open jump shot. We'll give up the three-point shot or a catch and shoot to her popping over Lay making a play. And while it wasn't perfect, Tolo still made an effort to get back and contest that shot. We all do one, two, make a good job of like boxing out. Tolo tags her out and we end up with a completed possession. While not perfect, we still stayed in our plays and got the desired result that we wanted from that pick and roll scheme. So now into step up screens, obviously what I spoke about, if you've got like players, both in pick and roll or like players setting the screen and using the screen that you can switch. And Keely does a good job of just presenting a crowd and keeping the ball in front. So does Maddie on the switch. And we just wall up, good hand pressure, and then we get a steal and deflection. And I will take it back to there that as we talk about like this, you can just see how we are. Tolo's coming in to help on that. Olivia's coming in. So it's all keyed into not only the two people on the ball, but where our off-ball positioning is in regards to that. And I'll show you some not-so-perfect ones. And from my point of view, um, and this is only me, um, other than last year in the playoff series against Adelaide where we uh, jammed and went under, there are not too many times where I'd either encourage or teach going under screens. Uh, this is one that we should never have gone under. Number one is Kia hasn't picked up the ball high enough. So she's broken number one rule by early ball pick up and pushing to the screen. Secondly, where the screen is set is where you've got to also talk about. So they're not always going to be on the three point line or higher. Our rule is if they're below the three point line, then you must go over. So the ball screen, the ball defender must go over. So here, Kia a little bit lazy, soft and lazy and late with the ball pick up, chooses to go under. Mercedes Russell, very good player, smart player, then rolls down on top. And now Kia now realizes she's got to get back over. So now it causes separation, which our rule is separation is switched, but because Kia's gone under, then she's gone over and got hit on two screens. It causes separation for us defensively and leaves them with a wide open layup. So. That is not something that we would ever want to do or that we practice doing, but I would encourage that if it's below the three-point line that you've definitely got to go under and goes back to my uh, one of my rules with the ball defender that you must actually get ball pick up and have ball pressure. So step up screen, this is high here. Um, we have two things on this. You can choose to go over or you know, and she's calling high, high, you can go bigger scat. So you can choose to get off and run around and get through the biggest gap and meet us on this other side. But here, Rochi gets clipped on the screen. Now there's separation. So now Keely has to switch on this. Tolo's got the nail. Kia can be in a better stance. Ollie's got the low help down here. So not bad positioning off our ball. So now Maddie knows that she's out of the play. She's no longer guarding the ball. But this little thing of Biting on the ball first makes you late to try and get back to this big here. So Tolo does an excellent job in plugging up the space, but Maddie's job is to run down and box her out of the play to stop her from rolling down. So Tolo can help because this player up here, Brianna Turner, is not a great catch and shoot, three-point shooter. But you see by Rochi's hesitation for that second or two going to the ball, leaves a late to get to that pass. And... I would say going back to this is Keely does an excellent job and now the ball's picked up. We've got to be two hands up and in to have better ball pressure on the ball stick once they get it up. 
So not ideal, but it comes up with a, a contested layup at least, or a contested shot. Here, talking about C Camp, we know she likes to go right. Um, it's a step up screen, but Abby Cabillo, really good ball screen defender, really good ball defender, quicker moves laterally very well, does a great job of just anticipating and stepping across and taking a charge as she wants to go right. So really good job of being able to, once again, goes back to individual scout, knowing who you're playing against, but obviously great anticipation by Abby and being able to take a charge in that play. Uh, middle pick and roll uh, with this. Just want to move this screen out a bit. Middle pick and roll. So here we were in ice on this. There's a corner. So Kia's in good help stance. I would like it to be a little bit wider with the hands up. Maddie's in a good help position. Tolo can be right on this elbow here. But Keely was late in getting here. But now Ollie's staying in front. And now for me, I coach this as Ollie's got it. She's got her head down. Kia's the help person. Keely can help, but stay there. She's not over-rotating, even though Ezzy is like not a great three-point shooter. But what we end up with is Kia's job is to stunt right there and get back to here. So we don't want to get that kick out three, but we want to present a crowd to Lindsay Allen with the ball. So while we make it contested, we never want three people guarding the ball. So Keely could have just stunted and got back to there and not caused rotation because going back, we were going to right here, we were going to force a contested layout, which is what we wanted. But we don't want to have three people guarding one because now we're in rotation about, well, who's staying and who's going because there was a lack of communication. You know, we get out of there okay, but it's not ideal because if that was a three-point shoot at the top, it would have been a wide open three. Force a contested shot. So middle pick and roll with the loaded side. Now most teams will clear out this side and not have that player in, which is harder to guard. But now good communication. Tolo's presenting a crowd. Ollie's got great stance and forcing it to the corner. Now this was part of our scout and part of our scheme was that we knew Kayla would pick and pop from this situation. And this was a, a play that Melbourne ran that was definitely like was always going to be a five out play. So we scouted this in part of our scout knowing that Kayla was gonna pop. So our rotation was Keely would have to come at this knowing that Tolo was giving help to Lindsay Allen because our number one was priority was not allowing her to get feet inside the paint. So her job was to stunt and go hard at Kayla. Off here knowing that this, you know, no disrespect, not a great three point shooter. That's a good three point shooter. Kayla's a good three point shooter. Rochi's job was to stunt and recover and get back to the shooter. So we'd stunt to the non-shooter, get back to the shooter. Healy stunted to the shooter, left the non-shooter open. Here, Maddie, brain fart, runs at the non-shooter, which leaves shooter in the corner open. So in ideal situation, what should have happened is Maddie just takes one stunt here and then she gets back to Maddie Garrick in the corner, allows Keeley time to come back and close out and play in front of Purcell. So here, similar situation, same players, but she's down in the corner. So Tolly does a good job presenting the crowd. Now, now Keeley stunts and buys her time because there's no one in the corner. Stunts and buys Tolo time to get back. So just being there with that great hand pressure and slowing Kayla down buys Tolo time to get back and puts doubt in Kayla's mind is, has I really got an open shot? And that's what we were prepared to give up. When we spoke about what we were prepared to give up, we were prepared to give up that open three or that shot to Purcell out there. So just caused enough hesitation time for Tolo to get back and make sure that that was a contested three. So here, middle pick and roll. Now going into this, Maddie's forced it like over. She got through the biggest gap. Alex did a good job of like loading up. And now here you see about anticipating and reading. She's picked it up, balls in the air. Now Alex has done a great job in getting back quick, but she's reading where the ball is in the air. And you know, Alex, God love her, not the best athlete in the world, but very smart at being able to read and anticipate plays and scout and gets a tip 
out. Here, not an ideal situation. There's no ball pressure. So especially uh, speak to our girls a lot when the ball is in the middle of the floor and you hear a screen coming, you must force it to the screen and you must close this gap. But here, Lily's still a, a young junior player and still learning, but now doesn't have ball pressure. So it's not an ideal situation. We want to always force it to the screen. So she should have been up here, changed her stance towards the screen. But here she gets beat, not ideal. But you watch Kia off the ball, does an excellent job in stunting in the driving lane and getting back and having a good hand and makes that a contested three. So while not ideal here, Kia does an excellent job in helping by stunting and recovering. And Lily stays on her hip to make sure if that turned the corner, it was going to be a contested layup. Hey, Gory. Yes. Um, could you just go back to that uh, middle pick and roll clip again? Yep. Um, just question, what's your communication with the middle pick and roll? So you said you want to force to the screen. Yep. Um, obviously, on the side, it's a lot easier generally to predict the screens coming from the, you know, the yep. top um, down and they're going to drill yes. off to the middle, yep. um, you know, unless it's a step up or something like that. But yep. it's a lot easier to predict. When it's in the middle, it's a little bit harder because they could flip the angle. Yeah. Um, they could come from either side. You don't want the player yeah. looking. So what communication do you use? Um, in to try in the middle, that? we try and keep it as simple as possible so we know what our schemes are. Um, so, you know, we go into our game knowing that in this pick and roll, it's hard show. In this middle pick and roll, it's a quick show, whatever. Yeah. So it's up to the big to tell the guard screen left or screen right. If they flip it, then it becomes a switch. Yep. But in this situation, Tolo would be calling... Um, which side the screen's coming from. And so Lily would now have to change her stance. So Tyler should be staying like screen left. So now Lily can change her stance to be able to push it towards the screen. And yeah. this is what I, I go back to uh, in one of my previous slides about the teaching part is about one, I don't know whether Tolo called it right now, but it's whether I would say is, did she listen as well? Yeah. So yeah. it's always... Communication's got to come from the big, but you've got to be able to like listen and then action what the big is telling you to do. But number one priority is try and force it towards the screen. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, it's like screen left, screen right. Yeah. That way they know which way to change their feet. Yeah, perfect, mate. All right, we'll go on to the next one. So here this becomes like into a side pick and roll and now it's easier because once again it's like a loaded side here and now ollie gets hit on the screen so keely forces a switch so which is fine so we switch now and this is something that you'll have to do you know depending on personnel with your own teams but the point i made previously is we never wanted ollie at any stage to have to defend a post player it helps that this is like on a loaded side here, but Kia does a good job of what we call like stunting and tagging. So when we talk about tagging, tagging is literally bumping, like bumping the cutter. So Sandy calls that tagging. With our tag, ideally we want Kia higher up the lane. So it's, she's in, in this area here rather than too deep. But knowing that that's Ollie being rolled down by their four man, Kia now comes and takes it and Ollie goes back out to the outside. So going back here again, right to here. Keely does a good job with hand pressure. So hands are up, trying to get a deflection on either a throwback pass or pass to the post. Tolo, excellent position being big inside. Maddie off the ball being excellent position. Kia's reading where the passer is. And I think that's something that we spoke about in all of our breakdown drills about it's not only about the position it's about what you see and so you're reacting to about where the ball is and what this player is doing either with the ball or with their eyes but kia tags the post player so now it allows ollie to recover out but she's in that good position to be able to steal the ball so once again here good stunt and this is where we get back to even at the start here maddie stunts in the driving lane and gets back to the shooter now they come and set it. Here, Maddie gets hit on the screen. So Tolo's in that drops position. So 
Toll has given help, excellent job being low and wide. Keely's in a great position here, a good position off the ball. Kia, really smart, really great player, is always looking and reading what the ball is like doing, so it helps with her positioning. So once again, she sees that Maddie might have to guard Turner. We don't want that. We don't want Maddie or our point guards guarding the bigs. Kia's a bigger player. So now Kia tags and takes this on the roll and gets a great deflection. And so just by, yet again, what I talk about, presenting a crowd in behind the ball, we get a steal and we get a deflection on that and force a contested shot. Uh, here, I'll take that back. So now we were not meant to be in drops on this, but obviously, you know, if the screen's coming quick, then we're not expecting our players to be in a hard show or at the point of the screen that we'd like. So we'd like Tolo to be up further here. Um, but here, Alex, they get hit, so there's separation. So we talk a lot about any time there's separation, it's a switch. So ideally, we want to toll at the point of the screen. Now her job is there's a switch, keep the ball in front and force a contested shot. Here, Ollie could have been deeper and been right on the elbow, even though that's lay. If Ollie's position had been open stance and been in here, she could have stunted. But these two are in great position off the ball. So Tolo now forces a contested layup or a contested shot. Alex, great job in boxing out and forcing that hard pass over to Mercedes Russell. You know, not ideal, but it's what we wanted. And now great job in Delaney forcing, walling up, forcing a contested shot, Tolo going over to help. And we force that into a tough shot over the top and come up with possession. Uh, these two clips are probably two exactly the same, but a bad one and a good one. So here it's side pick and roll. So Maddie does a good job in trying to get over. Tolo needs to give more help in here. Abby's at the right spot, knowing that this is, you know, one of the best shooters in the WNBL, but Abby goes late. So see how she's coming off. She needs to be as the point of the screen here, she's stunting right now. So she should be taking a big step and a hand towards the ball, then getting back to lay. These two are doing an excellent job in presenting a crowd to the ball here and showing numbers to the ball. But uh, it's her inability to be able to get there late. She sees bodies in front and it's an open layup. So not ideal because our help should have come from Maddie, uh, from Abby, sorry, even though that was lay. So here again, Similar situation, side pick and roll. We get caught, good help there. Now, Ollie's right at the nail where we want it to be. So she's showing that you can't get downhill. We want to limit points in the paint. So Ollie does a good job of stepping right into that driving lane and it helps that, you know, she's super quick, but does a good job of stopping the ball and slowing it down and then getting back and containing and getting a great hand to force a contested shot, which causes a turnover. So just by being in grade, and that's why I'm saying all the time is you don't want to get focused in while you're doing your breakdown drills. This is the focus two on two. But as soon as you start to break it down into more numbers, your focus has got to be about off-ball positioning and what their job is. Because Ollie's job was to stunt, recover, and force a contested shot. You know, that's a great defensive effort. Uh, Horns, another one that you're going to... Um, Another pick and roll scheme that you're going to get different on. So here, Maddie should be up on the ball and going closer towards that and being tighter with the gap, but there's too much gap into here, so there's no ball pressure. So she gets hit on the screen. So Tolo's got to give help. So now we end up with two on the ball, which is we never really want unless we're trapping. We stay. We do a good job of staying in plays, but... It's not ideal. Beck Cole like going right, and we didn't have enough pressure on right from the very start. So here in the horns, we're in drops. So Tolo's given space. We went morning lay to give the ball up to make other people take a shot and not give lay the ball. So as we come down, we stay in this for as long as possible, knowing that we want lay to make other people make the play. So Tolo stays, Ollie recovers, but Excellent job. You see this positioning here. Excellent positioning off the ball because she's reading that this is a threat for Mercedes Russell. And we crowd it. 
and we get a deflection and, and great reading off the ball. And now, um, so some questions, and we did this a lot. So we, we would drop uh, in some horns. We would quick show in some horns for game three against Melbourne when we changed to icing uh, with the step-ups. We also changed to uh, two-way and three-way switching um, in any horn set. So this is some ways that you can defend some horns, uh, which keeps your guards away. So in this situation, it's a, a two-way switch where Olivia now switches with Tolo. So our primary thing is we wanted to keep her in front. So we've got a big body in front. Now Olivia automatically takes the person who's popping. So to keep her to the outside and Kelsey takes the role. So it's just a two-way switch between Ollie and Tolo and Kelsey stays with the big. Now we like that because good hand pressure, it's their big where they're uncomfortable unless she wants to catch and shoot against our one of our best defenders in the league. So it nullifies them being able to turn the corner uh, and get feet in the paint. Now this is a three-way switch. So here, so Kelsey switches with Ollie, but now they roll quickly and the opposite post lifts. So Kayla pops and now Tolo has to take Ezzy because we don't want Olivia rolling down, getting rolled down by Ezzy. And Olivia takes the popper again, which is Kayla. Not ideal to try and go and steal that, but Olivia once again stays in plays. Maddie does a good job of like stunting and we force by getting in yet again off ball positioning. This is really great, like really good position. We're crowding the paint, forcing them to go skip passes but they can't see where they're going into. Another one, three-way switch. So here, Tolo takes the ball. Kelsey's now got to take the roller, which is Kayla. Here, and Olivia takes the popper. So we do a good job here, fronting, three-quarter fronting, gapping off because we know that they want to get Kayla on that non-shooter out here. Good help into there, good hand pressure, two hands, good close out. And now we're just in automatically pack off the ball, contested shot, come up with it. Uh, the three way switch again. So we switch here as he dives. So Tolo's got to take that. And in our scout, we prepared for this because we knew that at times what would happen if their next action was getting to a side pick and roll with two guards and we knew that they'd want to dive Olivia down. So we practiced that now, once they got into this side pick and roll, they may slip it or screen it and they'd want to roll Olivia down. That'd be another three-way switch off the side pick and roll. So out of this, Ollie's coming to the screen she automatically runs high, even though probably Ezzy could have been high or Lindsay Allen, but Tolo now takes Kayla. So we keep a big on her big and Olivia runs and gets out. So Kelsey stays on the big, Olivia should be sprinting out to get Lindsay Allen. But we switch on this because now there's been a blow by Kia's closeout wasn't the best giving a lead foot, but we try to stay in plays, we cause a switch and we force a contested shot. Now, uh, last set of video is what you choose to do um, end of clock uh, or end of quarter, uh, whether you switch it, whether you wanna trap it, whether you wanna hard show, whatever you need to do, that's something that you need to go in personnel. Um, something that we did, uh, especially with like Lay and Lindsay Allen especially, uh, were different looks either coming out of timeouts at quarter time we change uh, pick and roll coverages uh, and we had certain situations with certain people on how we defend uh, end of clock or end of quarter situations so here in this situation end of quarter so end of quarter one seven seconds left we wanted to try and take the ball out of lay's hands so we were in a hard show so kelsey come out to try and get the ball out of Lay's hands and then get back to her own. Good position by Frolling. Kelsey does an excellent job of getting back in front. Ollie's in a good position. We keep the ball in front and we force 
you know, not ideal. We force a contested shot on that and nearly shot clock runs out. Here, end of quarter, uh, six seconds left, we trap. So we wanted to trap Beck Cole, same thing. We'd leave Luella, we wanted to trap Beck Cole. Good stunt by Olivia now and she's got this. Here, force a contested shot. Shouldn't have fouled at the end. Uh, nine seconds left, so it's like this is an end of clock situation, not necessarily end of quarter. So you've got to differentiate uh, between the two, what's an end of clock and what's an end of uh, quarter situation is we three ways switched. So Tolo comes out, as you see, Kelsey comes in to take the roll and Olivia takes Ezzy out here, does a good job of getting back with hand pressure. Same thing, three, two, force a wide shot. Shot clock's down to one. We force that off a three-way switch. And in this, I just like end on this, is not everything's, as I said, not everything's gonna be perfect. Uh, and you've got to like live with these types of situations because you're going to play against really good players. Situation here is we get back. Ollie does a good job of staying up and in on lay, forcing a, contest a contested shot. End of clock, two seconds, lay makes that. And that's what I like put on there. Great players make great plays. You're not going to be able to stop everything, but it's about your foundation, about what you set defensively, about your ball pick up, your hand pressure, your positioning off the ball, all those things that I spoke about uh, certainly help. And I just don't think pick and roll defense is about two players. It's a, it's a team defense on how you want to defend it. So done. That was great, mate. Um, give me one second. Um, couple of questions and there might be yep. some more come through. Um, what's the risk of three-way switching and how would you attack? And basically the same thing, how would you attack three-way switching? Yep. Um, the risk in, I guess, three-way switching is if you don't do it well enough, you give up like the pick and the pop. So there's separation on the pick of the pop. So you've got to get to the point of the screen. So if I, if you get to, so Olivia goes to the point of the screen, if she doesn't get back to the person that's popped straight away, you're gonna give up open threes, or if the person that's popped can put it on the floor. So if they're good at like attacking off the, off the floor, so you saw those couple of clips where Kayla in the three-way switching didn't really wanna put it on the floor, but if you've got a four or five that can attack you off the dribble, it can cause rotations out of that. So it's easier when you're playing a pick and pop player versus a player that can pop, but then also put it on the floor and attack you and break you down one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, offensively, how to work, like attack it is, I think you've got to uh, slip screens more. So you want to play quicker into the screen. So not necessarily going and setting a screen. So playing where you run to a screen and slip screens and then use throwback passes uh, yeah. to get around that. No, that's good, mate. Perfect. Um, you spoke about a lot. You want to go over screens, um, particularly if it's you know three point yep. line and below. Um, which foot do you teach to go over the screen first? One closest to the screen, or are you happy to go with either? What's what's all you? Usually the one closest to the screen. So you know if you want to. So our number one thing is you change stance, and then you want to get our our teaching point is, and you you might have seen on some of those clips when I slowed it down and getting your foot over, but how well Matty Rochi did in getting like an arm over the screener so getting an arm over and pushing himself through so I, I always teach like closest foot or inside foot getting over yeah yep perfect mate um are you a pack or denial coach um i would say i'm neither um i think i teach both because there's certain situations where you want to be able to contain your player and there's certain situations where you want to be able to you know you need to quicken up the shot clock or in certain plays, you want to just deny them the ball. Um, so we do, I'd say I'm more of a denial pressure coach than what I am a pack coach. Um, but I, you know, there's time and situations for everything. I don't think one's right and one's wrong. Um, that's just how I, I, I tend to be a little bit more aggressive. But it also depends on um, personnel as well. Um, like someone like Lay, in one of the games, we just went for a whole quarter um, face guarder and deny the ball back um, yeah. 
and something that we don't always normally do. But I think that just depends on situation of the game, how you want to like attack it. But it's something that um, I'd play around with more. Obviously, if you've got more of a attacking driving team, like when we played uh, under 19s, when we played Spain, uh, we played pack defense because they're all about drive, kick, extra pass. Yep. So I think that um, there's time and situations depending on who you're playing against and what suits your personnel. Yeah, for sure. Um, it is interesting. Like when you watch, obviously, the pick and roll defense off the ball, you're going to be in more of that pack position because you've got yep. to, you know, jump to the ball. So it's going to look similar at times, but yep. um, you've got more of that hybrid. Um, so uh, another one for you, mate. There's a lot coming in now. Yeah, that's um, okay. Observing current junior basketball, you know, you see a fair bit. Um, not probably as much as you used to when you're the CLE head coach. But, not as much as I'd um, like to. What, what do you think the biggest area for improvement for the, firstly, the person defending the handler? What can we get better at there? And then the people that defend the, the pick, the screen. Yeah, the screens defend um, I think two, identify something. Yeah, probably my big three things with the ball handler is picking up the ball, uh, changing your stance and getting over the screen. I think that's the three biggest things. And you saw on like some of those clips when we were closer to the ball and had contact, it was much better in getting over the screens. And when we changed our stance, we could get over the screens easily or more effectively. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, and you saw on some of those clips, when you give the ball handler too much space, they've got space to either reject the screen or use the screen at will. So I think the three key things for a, a ball, ball handler or ball screener is picking up the ball and having ball pressure, the ability to be able to get over and change your stance. For the screener, uh, talking, number one, and then the ability to be able to have your feet set in the area that you wanna go. So on the ice, whether it's flat and in that show position, but being big and being aggressive. So if you're in a hard show, it's being big and using your space and using your length. I think that, uh, the biggest thing that I've encountered, not only with like the Caps players, and I coach some, you know, unfortunately coach some very good players, but even at times they, the screen defender gets caught up worrying about their own. Their first job is to stop the ball. Yeah. And I think that's where you've got to get the mentality out of the, the screen defender's mindset about they're just worried about their own. They're worried about their own if they slip the screen. If they don't slip it, their first priority is stopping the ball. For sure. For sure. Um, Couple more, mate. Just let me filter. Yeah. Them to, so I got to, I got to, I got to process them myself. But, <laughs> um, some suggestions for play development ideas for ball carriers uh, and screeners. So talking more on an offensive point of view, yep. I guess. Um, so sort of flipping the script. To, um, yeah, you got some. Yeah, we do a bit of like we do um, a lot on, I guess, breakdowns offensively because it's a big part of the system that I run uh, with the caps but also it's partly taken a lot of from what Sandy does with Opals because Opals is a very much a, a pick and roll um, orientated like team that we have is we do uh, breakdowns probably twice a week um, at the start of practice on pick and roll and all it is is two on zero so the ability um, and I think that and I'm not sure whether they did. I did a pick and roll offensive clinic for Brendan Joyce at Ballarat when we yeah. played Bendigo. So there may be some stuff online that you can find if that, I think that was video, but there may be some stuff online that that is really a breakdown of what we do with the caps, but is a hybrid of what Sandy does with the Opals. Yeah. Um, but we do a breakdowns two on zero twice a week, just um, setting screens, separating off screens, the types of passes, that the ball handlers are looking at, the types of shots that the ball handlers get and the types of passes um, or shots for the bigs as well. And we have an extra coach in that we kind of like have two balls going at a time. So the, the ball handler gets a shot and the big gets a shot. Yeah. Um, but I would say that if, yeah, if someone wants to, I can try and chase down with chalk. That could be online somewhere. The, the clinic that I did with, that was like this WNBL season yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for Ballarat. But, yeah, I think that you've got to spend time in one with the, I guess, the person with the ball offensively being able to get it at the right. We talk about catch spot. So if you don't get it, if you catch the ball like high and above the three-point line, it's useless trying to set a ball screen there where players can just go underneath. It's ineffective. So we talk about catch spots offensively where you want the ball carrier to 
or the person using the ball screen to catch the ball. And then obviously number one thing is to square up and play off your front foot, try and reject it. Um, but then giving players, I guess, the menu of what are their reads depending on how the pick and roll is being played. And that's what we do a lot of too in our, our breakdowns about, all right, if a team's in a hard show, this is what we do. If a team's in an ice, this is how we can break the ice offensively. So it's about, and, and as I said, we just do that two on zero just to give repetition to our players. Yep, no, that's great, mate. Um, we might wrap that up there because we've gone about an hour and uh, 10 minutes over what we said we would in total. So most of that was Shannon, though. I'll let you off, Corey. But, yeah, uh, thank you. But uh, I think um, um, I'm happy too that if um, you've got my email, if people yeah. have got questions and they want to email me, um, they can email me and I can answer them off email or give them a call. So happy that if you want to give out my email or yep. people have got it, they can just email me a question no, and I can no. either give them a call. Um, I will have out of office on my email. So just, just regard that I am out of office working from home, but if it comes up that there's an out of office, I am out of office, but I'll respond to um, emails or phone calls. If you want to um, ask any further questions, have a chat about that. Yeah, no, that's awesome, mate. I think um, a lot of the, the coaches will get heaps out of that tonight and just seeing how detailed um, and then and the complexity of the, the schemes at, um, at the WNBL level and obviously championship team. So it's going to be like that. But at the same time, how you value those simple things, I think that um, they take that away as well. So I think there was a lot there for them. Obviously, from my point of view, really appreciate you putting this together and giving up your time, mate. And um, yeah, can't thank you enough. So... Thanks again, and um, thanks to all the coaches for tuning in. We've got um, two great coach educators locked in for next week, so make sure you check it out. Do apologise that there were some issues with some coaches getting in. We had the wrong box ticked on how many uh, coaches we could let in. Oh, sorry, um, uh, participants, and we got that sorted, and they'll be all good moving forward. So apologies about that little glitch. Thanks for staying with us. I think that was um, you know great stuff from both um, Gorry and Shannon, and um, can't thank them enough. Kennedy and Jared did awesome last week and um, you guys have just built on that. So it's great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone's got anything, send it through.